So, welcome everybody to the tutorial, HPG tutorial. Uh, we are very excited to have this Vulcan uh, in three hours. Uh, so, let's, I mean, I want, first of all, thanks the tutorialist, uh, Lucas Lieb and Berno Kebel. I don't know how to pronounce it. So, I will just introduce uh, themselves and I will introduce them and then I'll give the word for them. Lucas Lieb is a third year PhD candidate in, uh, to IVN. His area of research centers, are, uh, centers around both real time and offline rendering with particular emphasis on differentiable rendering. Besides working on his own research framework, which is based on Vulkan, he contributed to the development of a Vulkan programming framework used in an introductionary, introductory graphics course at UAVN, as well as for a hands-on tutorial at Vulkanized 2023 conference. He also gave lectures about Vulkan at universities and Vulkanized. Bernard is a postdoc. Uh, please, Bernard. Yes. <laughs> And Bernard is a postdoc at INRIA University Cota Zuri in Graphic Deco Group. He obtained his PhD from the Graz University of Technology, followed by postdoc position at UAVN. His past and current research focus on point-based rendering, high-performance computing, differentiable rendering, and novel view synthesis. Bernard has uh, taught GPU programming lectures at several Austrian universities. So these guys were highly recommended by, by the community uh, to give uh, the Vulcan uh, short course. So we are strong, I mean, we are very happy to have you here today. And this guy, when I, we, we invited them to give this course, said, we need six hours of course. Mm -hmm. What? <laughs> six hours a whole day? And we said that three hours, oh, come on, three hours. <laughs> but then, then, the, two hours. Oh, then, then we went to have then you, you claim it and we will give you three hours. Okay. Mm. So, um, okay, thank you very much, and I hope you, all of you have a nice uh, tutorial. Yeah, thanks for the introduction. So, uh, we will today talk about the gentle introduction to Vulcan. Um, first of all, what is Vulcan? Wikipedia says Vulcan is a low overhead cross platform API open standard for 3D graphics and computing. Um, especially compared to maybe OpenGL, um, the low overhead aspect is very important here. Um, so what actually, actually means low overhead? It means how much code sits in between the calls from the user and then the, actually, the actual um, execution on the GPU or the device. And Vulkan is in this sense very low overhead. Vulkan is already in its third um, version. We have 1.3. It's a C API and it's very explicit. Um, this is, v in comparison to many of you probably know OpenGL, which is not as explicit. There's a lot of magic happening in the background. And with Vulkan, this is not the case. And it's more like a high-level hardware abstraction layer. Um, that, that is maybe one of the points that makes it so difficult. But the developer has all the controls. So the idea behind Vulkan in the beginning was to shift all of the complex logic out of the driver into the hands of the developer. And it is community driven, so everyone can participate and um, bring the standard forward. If I'm allowed to cite Chris Clover from last year's Vulcanized, where he cited himself, um, Vulcan is a broadly implemented specification that provides APIs to program accelerator devices. And that's kind of true, because Vulcan is, is, is becoming a central hub for, for instance, graphics API, uh, for, for graphics, as most of you know, but it is also a GP GPU API. And recently, it, it also is becoming a video de uh, encoding and decoding API. And maybe in the future, it will become a machine learning API too. I when Vulkan launched, it only had 119 commands. And with Vulkan 1.3, it now has 200 commands and over 180 extensions. And um, this brings us uh, to the support for Vulkan. It works basically everywhere and with everything. On desktop and mobile, on Apple hardware, thanks to Molten VK, which is a translation layer. And also on low-end devices like the Raspberry Pi, for instance. It allows exchanging resources with OpenGL, CUDA, DirectX, 
Um, for instance, you could use Vulkan as a front-end for your GP GPU application in CUDA. You can launch CUDA kernels from within Vulkan. Sadly, it's not documented yet. Um, but this is, uh, I think you can also debug this already in Nside. And you can in general mix graphics APIs. A good example is Crisis Remastered, which uses DirectX 11 for rasterization and only uses Vulkan for the ray tracing effects. Another uh, important aspect is extensibility. So Vulkan comes with a um, very customer uh, extension system. It does not require special vendor tools or intrinsics to, to allow these extensions. Uh, extension has the form of uh, such a form, like it starts with the VK namespace, then the author and then the extension name. So there are, uh, is quite a complexity in the notation, but KHR stands for Kronos extensions, X st or EXT stands for um, extensions that are mostly developed by multiple vendors, and often the, the Kronos extensions get integrated into the next version of Vulkan. But there are also vendor extensions, for instance, NVIDIA, AMD, Qualcomm, or Google. There are experimental extensions like KHX, which is the counterpart to KHR, or NVX, which is the counterpart to NVIDIA's uh, extensions. And there are instance and device extensions, which we will um, see later on. Another very cool feature is layering. So it allows you to intercept all the Vulkan calls. It looks like this, where the loader um, um, forwards the function call to the ICD, or if there's a layer activated, it forwards it to this fu uh, overloaded function and then it passes through to the ICD. ICD means installable client driver. And you can overload, uh, you can overload one of them, all of them. You can really mix this. So this is useful for validation. Um, most notable the validation layers, where you can check if a function is correctly called. Um, you can layer Vulkan over another API. You could call DirectX in the background or something. And for monitoring and profi or profiling, um, you could track uh, the, uh, the memory that you allocated, for instance. And it, uh, the notation for it looks basically the same as with the extensions. Uh, just you replace the extension, other you add layer to, to the string, and then you have the author and the layer name. There's a pretty cool website where you can check all this, uh, all the features and um, probabilities, uh, uh, yeah, all the features of the devices um, that Vulkan supports. And you can check for extensions there, layers. You can check uh, what formats are supported. And this is a pretty huge database. And we will use this in the examples later on quite a lot um, to, to get different types of uh, information about the device. So Vulkan in the wild. What are great applications out there that use Vulkan? Maybe the holy grail of a Vulkan application, a Vulkan game is Doom Eternal. Um, I've never seen a game that is this optimized. Um, for instance, ultra settings, 4K without ray tracing, you get 60 FPS on RTX 2060, or over 300 on 4090. I, would, I really would like to see this game run on a Raspberry Pi. As another example is Red Dead, Redem Red Dead Redemption, which came with a DirectX 12 backend and a Vulkan backend, and people reported that they get more frames with the Vulkan backend. And most recently, Proton, which uses Vulkan as a way to translate DirectX 12 calls and older versions of DirectX to Vulkan. Um, they use it on Linux to play Windows games or on the Steam Deck. And most modern games seem to work pretty flawlessly. So let's talk about today. All of this started when my dear colleague Johannes um, made this Vulkan lecture series on YouTube. Maybe some of you know this. And this happened because we tried to transition from our OpenGL only in introductory course to this to a, to a optional Vulkan um, flavor of it. 
and then he wrote an educational paper about this, and the second one, and then Kronos contacted him if he would like to hold a tutorial at this year's Vulcanized, where we developed this um, educational framework, which was also used by our uh, introductory course. And we got pretty good feedback there. And then today happened. So today's agenda is we will talk about basics first, um, then some rasterization, ray tracing, and then uh, Bernhard will take over and will do some compute and maybe also some more in-depth stuff on some things that I just briefly talk about. There will also be optional homework if you're willing to do this. Um, it's based on the Vulcanized tutorial so oh, and on the Vulcan launchpad that we created for this. You can just join this Discord, for instance, and um, since we also use this for our lecture, uh, uh, our university course, please keep everything private, especially the solutions. Um, yeah, just join this Discord. There's some text channel where you can insert your GitHub uh, name, and then we will uh, invite you to the to, to the repository that contains the the task descriptions. The Vulkan Launchpad itself is open source, so it's just uh, because of the task descriptions. And there will also be optional compute homework um, by Bernhard, which is a suite of 12 compute tasks. And yeah, you can get it also through the Vulkan Discord, uh, Vulkanized Discord. And please also keep the solutions private. Um, the, the restoration homework should require you about four hours. It's four tasks with one hour each, and the uh, uh, compute homework is one hour per task, so 12 hours, which seems like a lot. So before we start, Vulkan is a shared library. There are stubs for Windows available. Um, usually you load these functions. Uh, you need to load the functions from this uh, dynamic library. Um, you load the library, then you load the entry function, then you load the, the global functions where you get an instance, then you load the instance function, and then you load the device functions. But luckily, you don't have to do this because there are better ways to do this. For instance, Volk or the Vulkan HPP bindings, they all have um, function loaders included. So, how is this Vulkan API designed? Mm, I would say. 90% of the code looks like this, where you have some struct that describes, um, or is for setting settings, and then you have a function which takes the structs and does something. And it gives a result, you check the result, and if this is successful, then you get the handle, for instance, in this case, the instance handle. So there are two fields in the struct that are present in nearly every struct in Vulkan, which is the S-type and the P-next. And the S-type is important because you can um, cast a void pointer basically to the correct struct. And the P-next is important because you can change structs um, after each other. So if some extension comes out that add some new features and you need some new settings, you can just add uh, the pointer to a struct, to the f uh, a pointer from this configuration struct to this, uh, to this already, uh, this <laughs> to this original struct. And of course, always um, initialize the struct because it could happen that you have some values in there that are not zero and then you get weird errors that are sometimes hard to find. There's a second um, pattern, which is the VK command function pattern. With this means these functions are only there for recording commands to a command buffer. And um, they uh, these functions always take a command buffer as the first input. And this is maybe something that, that is easy to forget, especially when you're working maybe with CUDA in its most easiest mode, that 
the communication between the host and device is mostly asynchronous. That means both of these devices, uh, the, the, the host and the device can run simultaneously. And you try to uh, feed the, the device from the host side and you don't want um, that the device starves because it doesn't get enough work. And, and this is sometimes not easy to do. Also, always activate validation layers when you're developing, because in this example, it's hard to see what is wrong. And even the, the function returns success. But the validation layers say we need to set the depth to one. But it is zero because we zero analyzed it. And uh, this also gives us a link which we can look up online. And we fix this and everything is all right. So are there some questions already? Then let's continue. So let's start with the setup. We need to get a hold of all these handles in order to, to start doing serious stuff. We start with an instance, which is our current Vulkan context. This is the complete code that you need to create this instance. Um, it has the same pattern that we already saw before. Um, but here we pass another struct into the struct which specifies the Vulkan version. And we also need to specify the extensions that we want to use. And one good thing about the Vulkan version is that if you choose a high, uh, some specific Vulkan version, then you also get all the structs that come, uh, all the extensions that come with this Vulkan version. Because sometimes extensions get promoted and then are included in, this in the next Vulkan version. And we also activate the layers. We create our instance, and we're basically done. So now we need to select the device. And for this, um, we call this physical devices. These are the devices that are actually in your system. But we can have multiple of those. And um, other APIs, like OpenShell, sometimes just select a device on its own. But in Vulkan, you need to explicitly select one device. Um, so we could use the dedicated GPU number one, but we could also use dedicated GPU number two and just use the first GPU to display this stuff. Um, we can use both of them so they share the work. Or we could even use the iGPU and, and uh, use free GPUs. Um, so we start by curing all these device handles, or these physical device handles. Um, this is also a common pattern in Vulkan, where you, uh, f uh, when a function returns some array, then you first pass only a, a pointer to an integer and no pointer for the actual data. Then you get the count of it, and then you can allocate an array with this size and then pass this array pointer again to this function, and then you get the filled in or the, the array with the actual data. And we do this to get all of the physical devices in our system. We can use this handle to cure many different um, properties of the device. There are really um, 10 or 20 such functions. You can um, get m memory properties. You can get format properties. You can um, cure what, what, what extensions are supported, what layers are supported. And then based on this information, you can choose one of these devices. Um, in this simple case, we would just uh, use the first device because it does not matter for this example. Oh, I forgot to click. And here you can see all these different, uh, and there are even more, but uh, these are all the functions that can be used to get features and properties of the device. So another important aspect is the queue, because the queue is used to execute commands. And when we record commands, they get recorded into a command buffer, and the com command buffer 
is then queued for processing. And we can see this in this example. The command gets executed by the queue. Um, we can also submit multiple commands, or multiple commands can be submitted. And commands are processed in, independent in, in, in an independent order. So um, a command that is first, execute, uh, first queued could be executed last. And this can be a problem because it leads to, m to uh, memory races, for instance. We can also submit from multiple threads, but in, in multi-threading submissions, we need to have multiple queues because one queue can only be submitted from one uh, thread. And this is one advantage of, um, open, for instance, OpenGL, which made it really hard to do multi-threaded um, command recording. So what is a queue? And it's not so simple to say, but um, a device has multiple different queues and, so to say, multiple different queue families. And each of these queue families has different properties. For instance, some of these queue families can present. That means you can present an image to a window. Some of these um, queues can do graphics operations. Some of them can do compute operations. And some of them can do transfer operations. Some of them can all of those. And the less specialized the queue is, usually the better it is for these operations. Um, but we don't know for sure because this stuff happens in the driver. And you can only um, get a certain number of queues from this queue family. And we can look this up from this website that I told you before, um, which has all this information. So um, just a bit of code. Um, we would set the queue family index and the amount of queues that we want to queue. And um, then we would pass this to the device creation infrastructure. And that's it for now for the queue because the rest happens when we create the device. So there's a bit more. And we also need to activate um, extensions if we want to. And then we pass this struct again into a we create device function. And if everything works out, we get a device handle. And this device handle is quite important because we will use it for everything that now comes. And um, so we only activated the queue so far, so we also get to uh, get the um, queue handle back, and this is done by this function with VK get device queue. Um, yeah, it's not so important. So and here's a summary quickly, what we did so far. We have created a Vulkan 1.2 instance, which has these three physical devices, and we created a logical device from one of these three physical devices, which has a queue and some activated extensions. And you can see if we would have made a, or created a Vulkan 1.3 instance, it would also include these extensions on the right too. So, so far, any questions? that that happens so do you just wait for the operation to complete and then we will talk soon about barriers so you, there are ways to synchronize there are ways to synchronize on the gpu on the gpu with the cpu and between different queues and yeah there's there's a lot to talk about synchronization Maybe one short question. You mentioned that the more generalized AQ is, in general, the more better it is at doing a lot of things. Uh, and what is a transfer queue or a copy queue or whatever it's called? Um, so the graphics, for? the graphics queue is for rasterization tasks. The compute queue is for launching kernels. 
and the transfer queue is for copying data. You can copy data from a buffer to another buffer, for instance, or from a buffer to an image. Such things are uh, transfer. But we will talk about memory shortly. Right. So I think we continue. So now since we have our cri uh, device created, we can start with working with that device. And there are multiple different resources that we need or can use, and we will start with the memory, which is the most fundamental one, I think. So allocating a memory is quite easy, but there's this one field, memory type index, which makes this a whole lot complicate, more complicated. So what is the memory type index? Um, a GPU has multiple different memory heaps, and we can have device local memory, which is memory that is only accessible from the GPU. We can have host visible memory, which is accessible by the host, and we can have device local memory that is also host visible. And um, again, some information from this website that I mentioned. And here we can see we have around six gigabytes of device local memory, but we also have host visible memory. This is the memory heap one, which says none. And this, the size of this heap depends on how much RAM you have in your computer, because it's, it's memory that is, that is on your RAM, but, is, but the, dev uh, the, the device can read from it. And recently, there's also this device local memory that is also, that is on the device, but is readable from and writable from the host. This is the, the memory heap number two here. And this, for iGPUs, for instance, this is often called um, unified memory, because the iGPU shares the um, memory with the GPU, uh, CPU. And on dedicated GPUs, this is often called BAR, um, which is base address reg register. BAR is not that new. Um, I think AMD GPUs were the first that, that used this, but they could only address 265 megabytes of the memory. And now, I think since two years or three years, they, they um, support also this resizable bar, which allows the CPU to access the whole um, device memory. But for now, I think mostly you need to activate this in the BIOS. And also, uh, like I think mostly all vendors support this now. So. Now that we know about heaps, how do we create a buffer? So first we need to create the buffer, and then we can use this buffer to get the memory requirements that we need for this buffer. And we get this VK memory requirements struct back, which co has some content uh, which, which tells us um, what this memory requires. And when we use the physical device handle to get the memory properties of our device, we can compare these and find the correct memory heap that we should use. Um, this find memory type index function, which is the custom function, does that, but you can find some uh, implementation of this function in the Vulcan specs. But it just goes over all the memory heaps, compares some pits and some flags, and then um, returns the correct memory index. And then we allocate the, this actual memory and we bind it to the buffer. So a buffer is backed by some memory. But normally you don't do this yourself. You can use the Vulkan memory allocator for this, which is um, a library that simplifies memory allocation. And when we have device local memory, um, this gets loaded into the L2, L1 cache, and then um, uh, the, the individual threads can access it. So host visible memory is good for data that is often updated, maybe also m more on the smaller side, while um, the device local memory is better for um, fast data access from the GPU. For instance, images, most of the times you don't write to images that often, um, only the GPU uses it, and then it's great for that. Now let's talk about images. 
Um, they are basically the same as, as buffers. Uh, at least when you create them, they are similar. Um, here we have the, the buffer creation code again, and this is the image creation code. <coughs> so instead of the buffer create infrastruct, we use the um, image create infrastruct. Um, this, of course, has different um, uh, members. Um, for instance, you set the extent. Um, this is the size of the image. Um, and you also set the initial layout. We will talk about layers shortly, but for now, let's look at the vkget image memory requirements. In the previous example, it was vkget buffer memory requirement. This time, it's image memory requirement. And on the bottom, you can see bind image memory. And in the previous one, it was bind uh, buffer memory. So these, these layouts are quite um, So this, these um, layouts are quite complicated, um, but there's also tiling. So when you read an image on the CPU side, it's probably tiled linearly. That means that the rows are one after the other in memory. And this is not very good for the GPU access because on the GPU, um, you often want to have the four ad adjacent pixels so that you can interpolate them. And when we transfer this, this um, buffer on the CPU side to the device local image, we can change this tiling. We can change it to tiling optimal, which has exactly this property that um, neighboring pixels are um, close to each other in memory. And when we access um, this image, somewhere in between these four pixels. Um, the GPU reads these pixels and then, um, for instance, filters them when you use a sampler. But there's also the layout, which we can change. And before, we had um, image layout default, which is <laughs> default. Um, and for memory reads from the GPU, it's better to have the image layout is shader read optimal. Um, it's not really clear what the driver does in the background, but you could think of it like this. Um, if you read memory, this memory needs to go over the, uh, the bus, and this uh, requires bandwidth. And when we kind of compress these pixels, we can move more data over this bus. And this shader read optimal probably compresses the pixels in a way. And you can't always do this. For instance, if you write to this texture, maybe this compression makes it more complicated to write to this image. So you, depending on the use case, you would change the layout of these images. And this is something that, for instance, OpenShell also did not have. And that makes it a bit complicated. And then the pixels get more easier over the, the pass. So um, we don't specific the exact memory layout. We just specifi specify the usage scenario. In this case, it was shader read optimal. But there is also one for transfer source or transfer destination. So when you um, read from, one from a buffer or when you write or from an image, when you read from an image or when you write to an image. And hopefully, the vendor does the right thing. Um, these are some of the image layouts that exist, um, like transfer source optimal, transfer destination optimal. So as in summary, we have different image layouts. Um, what your GPU might do, we don't know exactly. It could do nothing, or it could reduce data or compress data to reduce the required bandwidth. There's image tiling. Um, it could be in, in, linear, uh, in a linear memory layout, or it could use Z ordering. Um, yeah, it, it could, in the worst case, it's the same as linear. So what exactly happens, only the vendor knows. There are two ways to access the content of, a, of an image. 
One is um, VK image view, and this is used when you access the exact pixel coordinates. Um, let's say our image has an RGB layout of the pixels. We could use an image view to change that so that we read PGR so uh, with blue as the first component. So an image view allows you to swizzle, for instance, pixel components or adjust the sub-resource range. We could have 10 mid-map mid levels, and maybe we only want to use five of them, so we configure that in the image view. Or a VK sampler, which basically filters the, the image for you. We can use a nearest neighbor filter that gives us the, 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 the color that is closest to the, the query point or we can use linear, which just interpolates them based on the four pixels. We can do even more with a sampler. We can access an image um, through, f through the use of floats from zero to one. We could also change that to zero to 10 or 100. Um, as, saw in, as we saw in the example, we can filter it during access, and we can specify out-of-bounds behavior. For instance, if we read the pixel out of its range, if you read the image out of its range, we can say repeat the image or mirror repeat the image. So now command buffers. Compa command buffers are very important for, for um, recording commands, which are then executed on the GPU. So when a command buffer has some commands recorded, it gets submitted to the queue, and then these commands get executed. But how do we allocate such command buffers? We need a command pool for that. So a command pool is always linked to a specific queue family. And then we allocate command buffers from it. There are two different types of command buffers, primary command buffers, which can be directly submitted to a queue, or secondary command buffers, which um, can be called from a primary command buffer. And this is the life cycle of a, of a command buffer. You first allocate it, then you begin the recording, you end the recording, it's ready for execution. You submit it, it's waiting for its execution, and when it's complete, it's back in executable state, you could submit it again, or you reset it. And the good thing about command pools is that you can reset all of the command buffers that you have allocated from this pool at once. And in code, this looks like this. We start the, com the command buffer recording, we end the command buffer recording, and in between we can record commands, like binding a descriptor set or um, issuing draw commands. Now let's talk about shaders. Shaders are programs that run on the device. It's a piece of code that gets executed on the GPU. There are two ways you can write, uh, there are there are two mainstream ways how you can write GPU code in GLSL or HLSL. GLSL is, uh, is, is was also used by OpenGL back then and got extended for Vulkan. And HLSL is the language that is used by DirectX. Um, as you can see, there's a Vulkan-flavored HLSL version or uh, notation where you specify the binding locations and so on through this double column things. And, and this is a very easy code that just copies data from a buffer to another, to the same buffer, but multiplies the value by two. So Vulkan consumes SPIRV binaries. SPIRV is an intermediate language, and the driver does the rest. So you have this high-level language, which is um, HLSL, for instance, it gets compiled to Spear V, and then it gets passed to the driver, which probably uh, translates it to ISA, which is the instruction set architecture for the GPU. So the good thing is everyone can write a compiler, even when the ISA is not public. Luckily, you don't have to, because there's TLSL, which is the, the reference compiler for Vulkan. And there's also DirectX, uh, the DirectX shader compiler, which um, nowadays also has a SPUV backend. So the GLSS shader code gets compiled by GSLAN to some SPUV binary. 
which we can then use in our shader module creation struct, where we specify the size of the binary and pass in the code array. And then we can create the shader module, which we then later use when we create our pi pipelines. But for now, let's talk about the descriptor sets, which is a collection of resources that we want to use in a shader. So one descriptor describes one resource. And descriptors are organized in descriptor sets. And each of these descriptors in the descriptor set has a given binding index with which you can access it. And these descriptor sets are allocated from a descriptor pool. And the layout um, of the um, attachments that descript are oh, not attachments. Um, the layout of the descriptors or the the types and the order of these descriptors, descriptors in the descriptor set is described by this descriptor layout. And in shader code, we would access these resources by using set equals some index, because we can also bind multiple descriptor sets, and then use the binding index to access the right one. Here we access a uniform buffer, which is binding zero below. And in this buffer, we can save some matrices and some vectors. So as I said, we can use multiple descriptor sets. And descriptor sets are bound during command recording. And multiple sets can be bound. So we would call vk command bind descriptor sets to, to bind the descriptor set, and then vk command draw to, to draw using this um, bound descriptor set. And in this example, we submit the command buffer to the queue. And the first command gets executed, the first command, uh, draw command gets executed, uses descriptor set A. And then the second VK command draw gets executed and um, uses descriptor set B and C. So the default way is to allocate from descriptor pools. The programmer manages the memories kind of manually. Um, you need to specify how many descriptors you want to allocate from a descriptor pool. Um, so there's an upper limit for that. But there are other ways to do this. For instance, with um, push descriptors, which store the descriptors inside the command buffer. And there's a maximum. And you can also queue this from your physical device if you want to have the exact value. Um, but normally, it's 32 descriptors per command that supports uh, descriptors. But there's also descriptor buffer, which is um, maybe the most flexible one, because you can allocate your memory yourself, or the memory for, or you can manage the memory completely yourself. So you can move descriptors in memory as you like. It's just a VK buffer. And another important extension is descriptor indexing, which does many things. But one of the most notable ones is that you can use the last descriptor in a descriptor set with variable size. Um, this is very helpful, especially for ray tracing. Because you, oft you, you need to have access to all of the images of your whole scene. And this allows it. Maybe you remember with, with rasterization, you often bind one texture, then draw something. Bind another texture, then draw something other. And you always have only one texture bound. And um, yeah, this is very nice. Now let's talk about push constants, which are an kind of an alternative to, to using descriptor sets for small data. It allows to quickly update data. Um, so as I said, it's an alternative to reading data from a buffer using a descriptor set, which is also kind of an indirection because you have to create the descriptor set and then you need to access the buffer. And with push, push constants, you can directly embed the data in the command buffer. 
Um, the size is very limited. It's only uh, it's at least 128 bytes, but it's 128 bytes for every command that supports um, push constants. And you most uh, the only commands that support this are pipelines. But we will talk about pipelines soon. And um, writing to this push constant buffer um, is not so trivial because you need to manage the, the offsets yourself. Um, for instance, here, if you want to update this float value, we would need to use an offset of 16 bytes and then um, overwrite four bytes with our new float value. And these push constants are recorded or set during command recording. And then this whole command buffer gets sent to the queue and executed. And in, in GLSL code, it looks like this. We, we specify this layout push constants. And then we have, for instance, a matrix. A matrix is a good, f is a good use case for push constants because the, model matri uh, the view matrix updates every frame. Um, it is there's also the possibility of adding offsets to this um, description if you have a more complex layout, maybe. So now synchronization. I will not go into too much detail here, but um, because it's a really complex topic. Uh, but for a simple example, this should be enough, I think. So we have four commands. We have an image, and the first command writes to this image. The second command writes to this image. The third reads and writes to this image, and the last one only reads. Now, we have a lot of threads running simultaneously, and the order is not given by, uh, from, from just this, the, the steps that we, uh, the, the order that we use for recording these commands. So we need some other way of synchronizing this. Um, and th th this synchronization is called uh, pipeline barriers, um, where we can put in between in between these two co uh, in between commands, we can add dependencies. For instance, um, this uh, that that reads can only happen after all writes are done, and then. Um, or writes are can only happen after writes are done in the um, in the stage before that. So these are pipeline barriers, but this is a very rough um, synchronization because we 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 um, just say that one pipeline stage can only happen after another pipeline stage. But we can make this more fi uh, we can make this more precise wh when we add memory access flex uh, memory access settings to it. So we could say a, a, a compute execution that that writes some memory can only happen after a compute uh, execution that reads this memory. Um, Another thing that these pipeline barriers can do is they can transition the image layout. So um, here we want to copy a buffer to an image, but the layout of this image is undefined. It would be much better if this layout would be um, transfer destination because we write buffer to this image, so the image is the destination. We can set a memory barrier before that call, which then transitions the image to this correct layout, then um, the command reads the buffer and then writes the content to the image. And after that, we want to access this image from a shader, so it would be better to have the layout as um, shader read optimal, and we can do this with the memory barrier afterwards. So, but there are many different ways to synchronize um, commands, and um, we spoke about pipeline barriers now, but there is 
maybe the most brute force one, um, which is just VKQ wait idle or device wait idle, where you just wait to for the device to be completely done with all work. There are fences which can be signaled on the device, and the the CPU can then wait for this signal. There are semaphores which can be used to synchro synchronize across multiple queues. Or um, you can submit a command buffer and say, when this is um, finished executing, signal some semaphore. And you can specify with another submission, you should wait on this semaphore to be get signaled before you start executing this command buffer. And um, render pass subpasses, which we will talk later when in during the rasterization part, and events. So, until now, we haven't talked about how we display images to an image, ah, display images to a window. Um, the core of Vulkan does not provide functionality for this. We, m we have to use an extension for this, and this is called the swap chain extension. And the method that we use is the swap chain, which is just a queue of images. And here, the um, we without a swap chain, you would draw to an image, you give it to the operating system to present it, you oh, and then you would get it back, and then you draw it again and present it. But this is kind of slow, and this is not in, in favor of this a asynchronous computing that I talked in the beginning, talked of in the beginning. In the swap chain, you have multiple images. You can acquire the next image, you can draw to it, and then you can give it back to the swap chain for presenting. And while this image is gets presented to the screen, we can already um, ask for the next image and render to it. So we get the next image, we draw to it, and then we present it. And this allows for, for utilizing the GPU as best as possible. In this case, we had two images, but you can use also three images, for instance, which makes this even better. Um, the problem maybe is that you could have outdated frames. Um, yeah, but enough of that. So, and now where everything comes together is the pipeline, which, um, which is a collection, I would say it's a collection of execution states. Um, you have some pipeline settings that are specific to that pipeline, but all of the pipelines in Vulkan share the same um, um, architecture. You have shader modules that describe the shaders that you want to use. You have the descriptor layout, which describes the descriptor that this pipeline will use. And you have these push constant ranges that describe which push constants you will go in you, you want to use. All of this doesn't, uh, the descriptor layout and the push constant ranges do not contain specific data at this point. It's just a layout so that the pipeline knows how to, to um, um, interface with them. And then you would um, bind this descriptor set, bind the pipeline, bind uh, and set the push constants, execute the draw command, and send this to the queue. And gets executed. So, any questions until now? Yeah. You were talking about the overlap of rendering work for different frames when we were, you were talking about the swap chain. I tried to get this working, and when I profiled it, I always saw a gap in utilization between frames and no overlap at all. Are there any common pitfalls that you know about with that? Um, there are diff I don't know what it's called, but there are different ways of presenting them. You can, like, first in, first out. Um, I think one is called mailbox. Um, I have been playing around with that, though. And Say again. I had been playing around with that. I tried various things. I could never get this overlap working. Okay. Hmm. 
maybe we can talk about it some more after the presentation, yeah, sure. but I'd be curious if you have any insights mm. there. What, what operating system did you use? Uh, I mo most, uh, mostly under Linux, but I think I also tried it under Windows. Okay, because I knew of an uh, issue on macOS back then where they used this molten translation layer and there were some, some features missing in metal and then they had this um, star somewhere in between. I, but I, sorry, I don't know the exact issue. I'll, for that. I'll hunt you down later and <laughs> we can talk about it a bit more. I have another, I have a question. Yeah. Um, if you go back just to the previous slide um, where you have these commands, mm -hmm. um, you said earlier commands do not retire simultaneously or in order, right? Mm -hmm. So theoretically the command push constants could overtake the draw command. How do I make sure that the command push constant is not overtaking the command that's the BK command draw, or is this just something that does not happen for those types of commands? It exactly, it doesn't happen for these types of commands. I think it's because it's, it just sets the state for the next command, uh, for the next draw command. Um, but yeah, for, for these commands, you don't need to. Okay, so they are implicitly synchronous or Maybe. within the command queue? Yeah, pr probably. Uh, I already thought about this, but uh, I have no precise answer to that, sorry. Hi, uh, thanks, so I had a question about something all the way back about buffers. So you have a whole, oof. <laughs> yeah, <oof. laughs> no, I didn't want to interrupt. Um, you showed that for a, I think, a image that was in device local memory that it would use L1, L2 cache, right? Uh, for host visible memory, does that also still utilize the GPU caches, or does the GPU s read straight from the host visible the memory GPU? without any caching? There are different modes to that. You can have it cached on on either side, but normally the GPU would then go over the read this data over the PCI bus. Okay. So the memory is located in RAM, for instance, and the the GPU would then read it over memory bus. Right. And if I would read uh, it, for example, in a loop, so I would read the same address multiple times, would it keep going to host visible memory or just read from host visible memory once, then sort in the L2 or L1 cache, and then subsequent reads would go to that L1 cache? If okay. nothing kicks it out of L2 or L1, then it should stay in there, I, I would say. Okay. But if you do some other stuff in between, then the, the chances are pretty high that it Thank you. <coughs> Thanks for the talk so far. Um, my question is about the SPIRV files. So I have uh, SPIRV files compiled and um, located next to my binary. Uh, do you have a best prax practice or, or an idea of how I could put all of that into one binary to so for my users or customers to not always have uh, yeah. Um, one solution is GLSL, uh, um, GLS, uh, G, how do you call it, GLSlang, um, has the option of compiling the shader into a header file that contains then the binary as a uh, uint32 ah. array, I think. Mm -hmm. So you could just compile it into the header and then include that into your code. That's mm -hmm. one way of doing it. Um, I think on Windows you can include resources in your exe, the executable. Okay. That okay. would be another way, maybe. Uh -huh. Yeah, but. Thank you. Yeah, or the, uh, the third way would be that you. Um, have the source code as a string in your C++ program and then compile it with a runtime compiler and then you can just use it um, when you compile it during runtime. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, so I don't use Falcon yet. I'm still stuck in a swamp that is OpenGL, unfortunately. Uh, but I just wanted to ask if you could maybe clarify on the out of order execution of things in a command queue a little bit because it, it's called a queue and things tend to go in the queue and out of queue. Wouldn't it instead, maybe there's some confusion going on, wouldn't it be the case that 
commands are processed in order, but because the GPU being smart and doing out of order execution and things may be finishing earlier, that you don't guarantee what finishes first. That's a good point. Right? Um, and maybe a follow up question because I was curious. I was reading the, the Vulkan 1.3 update notes. Mm -hmm. And again, I don't use Vulkan yet, unfortunately, but. Could you maybe expand a little bit on how pipelines have yep. changed since then? We will, uh, I will not talk about the rasterization pipeline and then uh, we talk a bit more about pipelines. Cool. But that, that's, I think, a good point that maybe they start at the same time but or start in order but just finish out of order. But it's, yeah. It's sometimes it's a, it's a bit of a guessing. Okay, then let's continue. Yeah, I think just one comment on the uh, recording on the, the commands. From mm -hmm. what I understood, it's when you record it, it matters in which order you put them in, but once you start executing them, they can be in any order. So, for example, with the push const, etc that kind of gets lo lodged together with a draw command or a compute command that preceded it, but once it starts executing, I think, mm. it, that it can go in any order. That would explain also this um, binding of the scriptor sets and, yeah. But, but thanks. Okay, then let's talk about the uh, rasterization. So, um, in Vulkan, you can do rasterization, you can do compute, you can do ray tracing, and this is, and all of them use different pipelines. And here we will talk about the rasterization pipeline. Um, so. And the rasterization pipeline or graphics pipeline um, consists of multiple stages, um, which are listed here. And when we execute a draw command, um, the vertex data that we put in gets uh, goes through all of these stages. Not all of them are active. You can configure this, which ones are active. But let's say we draw this triangle, the vertex processing would move this triangle around and scale it. And then it gets uh, sent. Uh, and this is done by the vertex shader. So there are some parts where we can um, insert code that then does what we programmed it to do. And then it gets sent to the desolation stage where you can subdivide the, the mesh, then to the primitive processing, which is also often called the geometry shader, which allows you to duplicate geometry. Um, and after that, it goes to the res uh, rasterization stage where the vector kind of representation of this triangle gets then discretized to actual pi uh, pixel colors. And um, depending on how this triangle is visible to the camera, different um, pixels are then shaded or um, marked as, as need to be shaded. Then we continue to the fragment processing, which um, can also be custom, um, custom programmed by a fragment shader. And here we can implement shading, for instance, by a light source. And then the pixel processing stage um, just writes this to a buffer and gets sent to the frame buffer for, for instance, display to an image at some point. So um, how do we get this triangle data into our pipeline? Um, we need to use a, a buffer for that, where we upload the, the vertex data. And when we execute the draw command, it goes through, in this case, the vertex shader and the fragment shader and gets them displayed. So how do we specify this? We have these this, um, structs again, um, where we specify the stride, um, so how much memory gap is in between um, the actual data, and um, how this changes, so for each additional primitive that we um, process, we jump this stride in the buffer. 
and in the shader we can then use this location index to to um, for instance in the vertex shader we then get this data in and we read that from the correct location that we set in this input attribute descriptor struct and we also specify the memory because the stride on top is just for moving around in the memory and the format is then actually reading that memory so um, this is the vertex shader here we read from location zero our vertex data we read from our descriptor set zero with um, the buffer at binding zero um, we, we get the transformation matrix which is then multiplied with our positions that we got and set to the GL position built-in variable and then we continue to the fragment shader which um, also takes in this uniform buffer but this time we take the color and we write it to um, we write it to location zero and what this means is we have some frame buffer bound and this frame buffer can have multiple attachments and each of these attachments can be accessed through this location and location zero just means that it's the first attachment in this fragment buffer we will talk about fragment buffer shortly <coughs> so we can have multiple different graphics pipelines this one uses all of the stages this one uses only some of them um, and this one uses the same amount of stages but with different shaders the problem here is that pipelines are quite static so we when we want to have a slightly different pipeline we need to build the pipeline completely new um, there are more settings for instance we can decide if we want to have field triangles or just the lines if we want to cull or if we don't want to cull anything and the same happens here so when we want to change one of these settings we need to build a completely new pipeline and the results from these two pipelines would look like this for instance um, shaded and only lines but there's some way around some settings can be set dynamically so when you create the pipeline you would specify I want to set the scissor um, uh, data dynamically that means when you record the commands you can also record a command that sets the scissor um, if you don't want to have it dynamically you have to specify it during pipeline creation so this needs to be activated during pipeline creation otherwise set it with the VK command function and um, we will talk about ways around this shortly but first talk about the frame buffer and the render bus together because these are kind of connected a frame buffer is a collection of render targets it's only used by the graphics pipeline um, it's a collection of images and in this example we have um, a bit of a deferred shading kind of setup um, with a depth buffer and a buffer for normals and a buffer for diffuse color and then a final output uh, buffer so all of them are um, collected in a frame, uh, frame buffer and we would access them as in the previous example by specifying the location index so now we also need a render pass because we need to specify how these attachments are then used when we start a render pass and for instance you could say when this render pass starts I want to clear all these attachments or maybe I want to keep all this content in, in the frame buffer and a good example maybe is if you render your scene you want to have the buffers cleared at the beginning but then you want to add some UI on top of it then you would specify in the render pass that you want to keep the content of the, the attachments or the these buffers because you want to overlay the, the UI so the render pass describes how frame buffer attachments are used and there's also something that allows you to synchronize sub passes so in this example we have two sub passes um, where the first sub pass only writes to the frame buffer uh, to some attachments of the frame buffer and then the second pass uses these informations and creates the out final output color 
exactly like you would do it in a deferred shading um, method. So sub was zero writes to the depth buffer to the color attachment of the uh, to to the normal buffer and to the diffuse color buffer, but leaves the final color unused. The second pass then reads in those those attach uh, these these images, and then does some calculations and writes to the final output color, which is then used to show to the screen or to the window. So um, the depth attachment is a bit special in this case because it does not contribute to the index or the, the it does not have an index, so to say. Um, final color, diffuse color and normals start with uh, zero index, one as index, and then two as index, and the depth buffer is, is a special case. And you can only have one depth buffer, per frame buffer. So <coughs> why do we even need a depth buffer? If we would render this uh, two triangles, the second triangle would just overwrite everything from the previous triangle, even though the blue one should be in the back because we don't use a depth buffer. The solution is just use a depth buffer. And you need to add this to the frame buffer as well as to the render pass so that the render or that, that the render pass knows, hey, I need to use a depth buffer in the frame buffer that was provided. Um, you can use different frame buffers with one render pass as long as they are compatible. And compatible means that they have the same amount of attachments or the, uh, that the render pass, um, when, when it is configured for four attachments, the frame buffer, for instance, would also need to have four attachments. And when we render this now, um, the shading is correctly. So what does the depth buffer do? It just saves the closest fragment that was rendered. And when a new fragment, uh, a new fragment comes in and its distance is closer than what is stored in the depth buffer, it is overwritten, and if it's farther away than what is currently in the depth buffer, it is ignored. So this, these things all seem pretty static, and they are, and that's why um, they introduce dynamic rendering, which streamlines this a bit, and it's basically a single pass render pass that can be configured dynamically. So um, the default rasterization pipeline would require a render pass during creation and requires a suitable frame buffer during rendering. The dynamic rendering now, which is also part of Vulcan, Vulcan 1.3, um, removes the need for both render passes and frame buffers. And everything can be dynamically specified during um, command recording. And it would look like this where you have a struct which configures the, 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 the rendering that you want to do, where you can specify the color attachments and the depth attachment, and then you just call begin rendering with the struct as input. So that's for, for dynamic rendering. And recently there was a new extension which is called shader object, which replaces the static version of a pipeline with a completely dynamic one. And it's like rendering in OpenGL again. So you activate this extension um, like we already talked about. Um, this only works with dynamic rendering, so you can't use shader object with, I think at least, that um, it doesn't work with frame buffers and render passes. Um, it provides a dynamic alternative to the static pipeline configuration. And um, it looks like this. So you have a lot of commands where you can set all of the settings that you normally would set in a pipeline configuration struct um, on the fly during command recording. And here are uh, some of these functions that would set things that we talked about in this, uh, in this part. So we can dynamically set the vertex input. We can dynamically specify the cal mode that we want to use. And we can even dynamically bind uh, or set shaders. So we could set the vertex buffer, we can set the fragment buffer, and 
render something and then just swap out the fragment buffer. In, 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 in with static pipelines, you would do find a completely different pipeline and create it also first. Oh, so, any questions? <laughs> or I can repeat the questions, otherwise. You, you, uh, on your example where you had two subpasses, mm -hmm. um, is the advantage of having subpasses the idea that maybe a mobile tile-based thing doesn't have to go back to memory? Like, I wasn't clear on why you'd use a subpass versus two, two passes. Um, so the goal is always to have the least amount of synchronization between things so that the GPU can utilize available cores as best as possible. And um, and subpasses are uh, basically a way of doing this. Um, I c I can't really go into more detail, but I hope that's enough. And that's also why they're doing the dynamic frame because on desktop GPUs you don't really need them. Hmm? But is it because of the how tiles rendering works on mobile phones that they introduced this in Vulkan? Can you say it again? Um, the subpasses is because of tiles rendering. So you subdivide your screen into big bins. Mm -hmm. You bin all of the turnings that you're drawing into those bins, and then each bin is processed separately. Um, uh, if you know you're going to do multiple passes, you load all of the attachment or that small tile of each attachment into mm -hmm. some special cache, and then you do your drawing. Um, and after that, you need to write it out to memory. But if you know there's going to be multiple passes using the same um, resource, and you just keep it in the cache and do those multiple passes. That's a good point. One after yeah. the other. Uh, so tile rendering, rendering, this could be helpful. And I also think that shader objects were created because pipelines are not odd. Uh, let's say pipelines are not as static as Vulkan sometimes makes them to be. And there's much more flexibility in that, and that's also why it led to this um, shader object development. OK. okay. Um, uh, thank you for the time. Uh, maybe one question I have is regarding shader objects, actually. This takes us a bit more close to the old OpenGL API, where you're saying mm -hmm. GL enable this, GL enable that, GL dispatch that. Yeah. Um, but you're still submitting all of this to a command buffer, right? Which yeah. means what you're not doing, which nobody really liked about OpenGL, is setting global state flags. That's true. That's why a lot of people complained about this. That's very nice. <laughs> yeah. That's also why the joke comes that we're going back to OpenGL. Yeah, but I mean, you're avoiding the worst part of it in this case, uh, yeah. which is that you don't know whether depth testing is enabled or not or whatever. The good thing is you can always use the other things. Yeah. So I, I think it, the, the goal is that you make the entry into, into using Vulkan more easier, more streamlined, um, because you probably know this meme with 100,000 uh, lines of code just to draw a triangle. Like, how much easier is it with that, with, with these, how's it called, shader object extension, like in terms of lines of code? Um, like, give a number of how much do I need for the initial Vulkan uh, release 1.0 to draw a triangle, and how much lines of code do I need with that extension? That's hard to say. Do you mean in, in lines of code? Or, I mean, if it's a nice, if it's a complexity. That's what people always complain about. You need this and that many thousand lines of code to draw a single triangle in. The I, um, f I can say for dynamic rendering, it changes really a lot. Like, it makes it way easier to do all this. Um, I haven't experienced that much with shade objects yet because I think it came out only three, m three or four months ago. Um, But at least dynamic rendering makes stuff a lot easier, at least in my experience. So I have a question. Um, yeah, sure. Would you recommend it to teach it this way, to use the shader objects? That's a hard question. Um, is it like way slower or something? Are there any real problems? The claim it? is that it is, it, is, it is equally performant, but it could be a bit 
worse in certain situations. It, it, it's a bit hard to read. Like they, they say it's exactly the same, but it can also be not. Okay. One more, one more question about the shader objects. Um, mm -hmm. What's the default state, and can you like s batch set the, the options? Like, I haven't seen anything to patch set them. But what's the default then? I think there is no default. You need to set it. So you need to have all of the settings. I think so. Okay. But maybe I'm wrong. Uh, or someone else knows. Okay. Then I guess I continue with ray tracing. So, for ray tracing, there's again another different pipeline, the ray tracing pipeline. And the ray tracing pipeline has the following um, uh, structure. Um, we have this. Uh, so, we have the ray generation shader, which spawns some rays that are then get tested for intersection using a accelerated. Uh, uh, using acceleration structures, which are just, just optimized structures that allow for quick intersection test testing with, with rays. And then depending if there's a hit or not a hit, um, a miss or a closest hit shader is called. There are optional other stages which I'll talk about soon, but um, that's the, the simple version of it. So we can have either um, triangle meshes, but we can also have access aligned bounding boxes, which allows to implement procedural objects. For instance, this sphere, which is uh, just x squared plus y squared plus z squared equals some radius. And you can use this formula then to, to implement this in this access aligned bounding box. So here we have our pixel grid. The ray generation shader spawns a ray, which is then tested for intersection, but it does not hit anything and we call a mist shader, which could then shade the pixel black or so whatever the background is, or just ignore it. Then um, we move a bit further to the right, and we again execute the ray generation shader and uh, start the um, acceleration structure traversal, and this time we hit something. But since this is an, an access line bounding box or an procedural geometry, and we also need to specify an intersection shader. And that's what I, I said with this um, formula for the, for the sphere. Um, here we need to implement when this, uh, when this ray is a hit and when it is not. And if this intersection shader reports, yes, this is a hit, this intersection gets recorded. And if all of the intersections along this ray are tested, the closest one is chosen and and, and the closest hit shader is called with this object index that was hit and is also the closest. And in this case, we shade the pixel green. Again, ray generation shader, traversal, closest hit shader, green. Um, so this time we miss again. And now it's uh, again a hit, but this time it's the triangle mesh that we hit. In this case, we don't need an intersection shader because there's a built-in intersection shader, you could say, um, which is just a ray triangle intersection test. And we call the closest hit shader for this and shade it pink. Again, pink. So, um, so in order to test a scene for intersections, we need acceleration structures, which are a bounding volume hierarchy. And there are two types of this. There's a top level and a bottom level one. We will now talk about the top level one first. So the, the top level one only contains instances of the objects in the scene. So for instance, for this um, green 
board for this procedure, uh, procedure geometry case, we have three of them in the scene, but we only need it once in data, and we can just uh, instantiate it uh, throughout the whole scene. Ooh. And for the tree, it is uh, the same, but in our scene we only have one of them, so we only need one instance of this triangle geometry. And both of these uh, objects are in a bottom-level exploration structure. So a bottom-level exploration structure contains the actual geometry and um, builds a bounding volume hierarchy around that. And then it gets referenced in the top-level exploration structure. In the for the leaves, it's three times the, the exploration structure number one. And for the tree trunk, it's um, once the exploration structure number two. There are multiple different um, things that we can set per instance. The maybe the most important one is the transformation matrix. So we can um, set a, a move, a position, this one bottom exle level acceleration structure at multiple positions in the scene. There's um, there's also a mask which allows us to include or exclude um, some of these objects during intersection testing. There are flags which allow um, to change the winding order for backface culling, for instance. But note, in ray tracing, backface culling is not an optimization. It can make things uh, even slower. And an offset which is used for selecting the, the shader that we want to execute. We will talk about this soon. And we can also specify a an, an custom instance index. Um, so in the shader, when we hit some object, we get an index back. And this allows us to differentiate between different objects that we hit. And there's also already a, a default one built in, which is the order in the top level acceleration structure. So for the tree, uh, for the leaves, it's one, two, two. Uh, yeah, one, uh, uh, zero, one, and two. And for the geometry, uh, for the triangle geometry, it's free. So, um, building these acceleration structures is a bit uh, complicated because we need to build them on the GPU. So we first build the, the triangle geometry bottom level acceleration structure, and then we build the the um, procedural geometry acceleration structure, and then we get the handles for them. We can, and then we can add them to the top level acceleration structure, and then again build it also on the GPU. Um, for building, we need to, um, on one hand, allocate memory for the actual geometry, but we also need to allocate memory for some scratch buffers, um, which are used during building of this uh, acceleration structu uh, structures. So the this is a very naive version of a bounding volume hierarchy uh, structure. But as you can see, each of them has a bounding box. And when we do uh, ray intersection tests, we can go through all of these bounding boxes first and then go more detailed. So to say which triangle exactly was hit. But this. Um, uh, building of acceleration structures improves this a bit. So um, again, we don't really know what exactly it is doing because that's um, uh, vendor dependent, but uh, at least something like this. And then we have one big bounding volume, uh, bounding box around the whole scene. And when we now trace one ray, the ray gets first tested for this big bounding box that that encapsulates all of the scene. And if it misses, it just stops. Uh, but in case it misses, uh, it in case it hits, um, we go deeper down this tree. Now we we test also the the procedural geometry, but also the the, the tree the tr uh, triangle uh, based geometry. So first, and there's one thing. The order of intersection testing is not specific. So it can happen that 
things that are in the back are tested first, and then things that are in the front are tested first, uh, uh, later. So um, this can make it a bit hard to do um, blending, for instance, because you never know really um, which one is, is tested first. So now we test the uh, procedural geometry, and since this one is closer, ah no, ignore that, please. Um, we need to go more into detail here because this is an implicit geometry. So we again call this intersection shader, and it gives us back the distance and the position at where we intersected the sphere. And since uh, this sphere was closer than the tree the closest heat shader gets called for this tree, uh, for this leaf. So now comes the hard part, the shader binding table, which is a collection of, of shaders that you maybe will call in your um, ray traversal. Um, the, the address or the, the memory locations where this different um, shader tables are located, are passed in when you call this VK command trace race command. Um, this is the equivalent to the VK command draw command for rasterization, kind of. And um, in the shader, so, so this VK command trace race call executes the ray generation shader. And in the ray generation shader, you call the trace ray ext um, function which then uh, takes in this acceleration structure that is in your descriptor set and does some ray intersections with it. And as you can see, you also specify the origin and the direction of your, of your ray that you want to test. So the shader binding table is, as the name says, just a table, but it contains different kinds of shaders. And one of, one of these shaders is the, the ray generation shader that we already saw. Um, but also we can specify different closest hit shader for the different um, types of geometry that we have. We could, for instance, have one closest hit shader for all of the materials that we have in our scene and um, we specify this by um, giving the start address to the memory location where all of these closest heat shaders are located. And lastly, we, we also need to add a miss shader, w uh, which is called when nothing is hit. So the shader binding table is a buffer. Um, the addresses are passed in during command recording there are really many ways to define a shader binding table offsets. Um, in the Vulcan specs, you can find the formula for it. And you can set it when you add, add instances to a top level acceleration structure. You can set them in the shader itself. Um, yeah, there's really a lot you can do. And one of these shader binding table entries can refer to one, two, or three shaders. There are different shader groups. The general group is, a, is the ray generation shader or the miss shader, but there's also a core level shader, which I never mentioned before in this, in this uh, talk. It's basically just a shader that you can call from within a shader. Um, I, I think someone once said that this core level shader is just an inline in your shader, which makes it n not that useful, I guess. Um, but these things are always hard to say what really happens. And um, in the shader binding table, for the general group, you only specify one shader. For instance, here the ray generation shader. And in the next row, you specify the miss shader. But for the triangle heat group, you have closest heat shader and any heat shader. And you can specify both of them. So what does the any heat shader do? The any heat shader gets executed every time you intersect some object. Doesn't matter how, how far or close it is and doesn't matter if it's even the closest hit. It, it, it gets executed for any hit. Um, why do you want to use this? For instance, for transparency. Um, if you have 
just a square, uh, a square, uh, a square triangle mesh, and you have some leaf on it uh, as a texture. But there are some parts that are should be visible, uh, should be transparent. You could uh, then hit this uh, this geometry, and then in the any hit check if this is actually something with an alpha one, for instance, or if the alpha is zero. And if the alpha is zero, you just ignore this hit, and it will never be considered for the closest hit intersection. And the same thing you can do for the procedural hit group. There you also have closest hit and any hit shader, but you also additionally have the intersection shader, which you can use to um, specify what is an intersection for this procedural hit group, uh, for this procedural geometry. So in the shader binding temple, we only use the closest hit and the intersection shader. And I think if you don't specify intersection shader, it, it will be just considered as a box, like an axis line bounding box. So there's another thing, ray curies, which is exact, uh, which is exactly ray tracing, but you can do it in any shader. Um, for the normal ray tracing, you need this ray tracing pipeline, and you have these many different shaders, and uh, they are called in independent order. And with ray curies, you can just um, do some, uh, basically check for intersections in your fragment shader, for instance, or in your compute shader. So ray queries require no ray tracing pipeline, no shader binding table, just the acceleration structure. And it allows intersection tests to be done in any shader that you, uh, that is available in Vulkan, I think. Compute or fragment shaders. The performance between ray queries and ray tracing pipelines can be different. Um, I, I think it, at least in the beginning of when this came out, uh, ray queries were slower than ray tracing pipelines. I don't know how it is nowadays. But there's one thing that, that um, gives ray tracing pipelines the upper hand. Um, recently, this shader execution reordering, re reordering was introduced. Um, and this cannot be done with ray queries. Um, the reason for that is that in a ray tracing pipeline, when you hit objects, you call these different types of shaders depending on what objects you call. And if a lot of threads um, do different executions than other threads, then um, because of this branch divergence thing, um, both of them need to be executed. I but they are masked out for one group while they are executed in the other group, and then it's the other way around. And this wastes a lot of computation. And sh so the shader execution reordering tries to group similar executions together. So it tries to group similar shaders together so that the GPU is best utilized. And since you don't have these different shader calls in a ray query, you, you, you can't really do that. And Let's take a quick look at what ra uh, how rage queries are programmed. So it is basically a query operation where you call this function in a loop, and this returns true as long as there are some intersections to process. And then you have these two functions that return. Uh, you can you can compare the result of these two functions if it's a triangle or if it's a access line bounding box, and de depending on what it is, you, you choose one branch or the other. And then if you're happy with this intersection, you can confirm this intersection, and then it will be considered for um, basically the closest hit shader in the end, which you can then query again. And here you would then check if there um, was some intersection or not, or reported intersection, you would say. Because you can just ignore some intersections, and then if there's no other reported one, then um, of course you don't have any one in the end. So that's basically it for ray tracing. <laughs>
Can you hear me? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would like to ask you, how do you basically pass some information that might be required from intersection to shading, like normal from the sphere is, is a typical example. Mm -hmm. Because if once you compute a point, then it gives you the normal, or if it would be ellipsoid, it's different. Mm -hmm. Or another example is like UV, param UV parametrization for texturing uh, for triangles, so how, how this is done. Um, so one way would be that you do all this in the closest heat shader, so like getting the UVs, reading the texture and that stuff, or you could just um, pass this information from the from the specific shader back to the rate generation shader and do all in, in, in the rate generation shader. And there are, um, uh, what's it called? payloads which you can write from the intersection shader, from the closest hit shader, from the miss shader, and then you can read that back in the ray generation shader. But you should keep the, the ray payload, um, or these payloads relatively small because um, things get slow quite fast when you make them too huge. This was this was just basically a, uh, a comment. You said that the acceleration structure had to be built on the GPU. I believe you can uh, choose either do a CPU build or a GPU build and various quality setting That's um, true, effort yeah. levels. Yeah, there's, there's, there's the option to build this on the CPU too. But you need to queue for if it's supported, of course. Okay. F for instance, on my system, I think it was not supported, but I don't know. I, I haven't looked that much into it. Um, are you aware of any um, compilers from C++ to Spear-V? Because it could be a lot easier to debug your ray tracing pipeline in C++. That's true, and that's one point um, that a lot of people would like to have. Um, there's this Circle compiler um, by Sean Baxter, I think. And he he has this experimental C++ compiler with all this fancy stuff, but he also um, added PRV support to it. So you could write uh, your shaders in C++ and also have it together with your host side code. Um, the problem was just that th his compiler is closed source and only works on Linux. Um, but there are a lot of people, or quite a lot of people working on providing alternatives to, to this GLSS. GLSL and HLSL uh, compilers. For instance, there's Rustlang, which is a Rust compiler to SpearV. And I think also the DirectX compiler team is working on integrating this into the LLVM um, mainline, uh, mainline uh, GitHub repo, uh, mainline code. So, um, And they also try to close the gap between HLSL and C++. But there's still not a perfect solution, sadly. But we, I think a lot of people hope for this. Hi. Um, in one of your last slides for the ray query, you showed that you check whether an in you have a while loop and you check whether it's either a triangle or an excess line bounding box. Is it, uh, as far as I know, at least for I I'm only mostly familiar with tight X, it only says acceleration structure. Is it guaranteed to always be an excess alliance bounding box, or could a vendor decide to do something else? I don't know, spheres, oriented bounding boxes. Uh, uh, so m you mean, um, does it always have to be an excess aligned yes. bounding box? Do you now mean for the acceleration structure, or do you mean for the uh, procedural geometry Wait, creation? So does this loop show? Is this AABB, is that a mm -hmm. procedural geometry or is that like a node in the exist line, in ah, the, the hierarchy? Um, so this, this pro procedural geometry is always an access line bounding box. Ah, okay. But you kind of build it into the access line bounding box. Okay, no, sorry. With this, sorry. Uh, in, in the case of the sphere, like this x square plus y square plus z squared equals zero, would uh, zero uh, equals one, would give you the surface of the sphere and then when the ray comes in, you can check if 
based on that if the ray intersects the sphere and then report an intersection. Oh yeah, so just some misunderstanding from my part, don't mm. worry. But it's always an access lamp only box, yeah. Hi, uh, so could you explain a bit uh, maybe how does um, transparency work and um, how do you blend together um, colors if so something is behind it? Um, do you mean now blending or just transparency? Um, just if something is behind uh, a, like a semi-transparent object, then how do you uh, continue like searching for um, S stuff? So, okay, you, you shoot a ray and you hit some object that is transparent. Then the any heat shader gets called for this object and you would... Um, For instance, yeah. yeah. Not, not proper transparency in your research. Because it's at least, it's unfortunate, but it's, it's, it's linked to something. Yeah, that's true. I mean, if you would model real transparency, like glass or something, you would do it completely different. Like with actual geometry and um, doing reflection and refraction rays and, and that stuff. But if it's just about blending some object over other objects, this is. This is, I would say, not really solved yet. I mean, it's also hard because blending works from back to front the best. But if you, for instance, bl try to blend things from front to back, it, it, it suddenly becomes really difficult. Um, there are some ways that you can solve this, but it, it would, it's not 100% correct all the time. And it also depends on how, m how man many transparent uh, geometry you have along the ray. And with two, maybe it, it works quite good. But if you have 10, then, then the results can very differ from the correct result. Yeah. Uh, I'm wondering, this whole API looks very similar to the optics API. So are there any advantages or disadvantages to using one of these if you're working on an NVIDIA GPU anyways? Uh, please say it again. So if you, uh, I think this whole API, this Vulkan uh, thingy is basically an API specification, as you said in the very beginning. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it looks very similar to the optics API uh, provided by NVIDIA. Mm -hmm. So if you know that you work on an NVIDIA uh, GPU and you don't need the portability of, of Vulkan, are there any disadvantages or advantages of using either of those? Um, I think in the end, no matter what API you use, the, the end result is, it, it all boils down to the same thing in the driver. Um, and yes, the optics API and the ray tracing API for Vulkan is very similar. They both have these acceleration structures, they both have this shader binding table. And if you're only working on, on um, NVIDIA, then it's, it's the only advantage that you have with, with cooler than is, of course, that you can program in C++. Um, Performance-wise, I think you can do this the same things basically. I mean, CUDA also has different ways of approaching this. You have the driver-level API, or the more high-level one, and w with the driver API, you can probably um, achieve the same thing. Okay, thanks. So, on, well, one thing is you can mix rasterization with ray tracing, which with optics might be a little difficult, but. Uh, on the question of transparency, has anyone here, like what would be the state of the art in terms, what would be the fastest path for rendering like transparent blades of grass or something like that? Would it, would it be rasterization or would it be uh, ray tracing? Mm, maybe someone would say that maybe software rasterization is even faster. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, has anyone, does anyone have an opinion on this or? I think if, if there are many try, trying, I mean, Bernard could probably talk better about this, but if, it, if multiple triangles are within one pixel, then software rasterization could be better. Um, 
otherwise hardware rasterizations. But I've, is this correct, Bernard? So in particular, uh, transparency. So we've recently gone a lot into transparent things, but this was for different application case. So with, with the explicit use case of, I, I guess, the, the target here is foliage. Um, I'm sure there's experts, but um, unfortunately, we both of us, that doesn't cover our expertise. So yeah. We would need Marcus here. We're getting better at this. <laughs> um, so maybe naive question, but how do you actually uh, go to secondary rays using uh, ray tracing pipeline? Like how do I uh, take my closest hit shader knowing I've hit something and say I'm building my first path tracer, how do I feed back into a ray generation shader? Do I like have a secondary buffer with like a, a head that I move and push data in or does the API support this somehow? Good question, and I totally forget about this. Forgot about this. There are many ways to do this. You can do a wavefront ray tracer, which you described in the end, where you do some intersection, write everything to a buffer, and and then do another call and do the next depth intersection. Steps. Yeah, and you you always go narrower and narrower um, because you can just ignore. The, the pixels that did not hit anything. So if you if you shoot rays at the cube, then most of them miss, but only a few of them will hit the cube. And then you can um, do the secondary bounce only with those few rays that hit. And then you can also spawn less threads and um, utilize the, the GPU better. The problem is that then the bottleneck is the bandwidth. And um, as recent papers have shown, um, wavefront ray tracers are um, slower than, um, what's it called? Uh, hmm? Mega kernel, exactly, yeah. Mega kernel type of ray tracing. Um, now back to this mega kernel approach. Um, you could, when you hit something and the closest heat shader gets executed, you can call a recursive call to the trace ray function. So you, 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 you start with the ray generation shader, you trace a ray, you hit something, closest hit shader get called, and in the closest hit shader, you again call the trace ray function, and um, you can do this a certain amount of times. Um, when you create the pipeline, you also specify the maximum recursion tapped. And I think, uh, depending on the device, and you can check this on the website that I showed, or you can cure it in code. Um, I don't know what the maximum depth is, but probably 20 or so, or maybe 12, and depending on the vendor and, and the GPU. And if you don't want to do this, you can just um, return the data from the closest hit shader. So when, you, when, when the closest hit shader gets executed, you get the in, uh, the instance index, which describes which object was hit, and you get, um, for a triangle hit, you get the pericentric coordinates. You can just return these informations back to the ray generation shader through the, the payload, and then um, do the second bounce again in the ray generation shader. Then you would kind of have a loop, um, uh, which goes from zero to the depth that you want, and um, you but then you're basically doing a full shader that is itself the path tracer or something similar. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah. the closest yeah. hit would then consist only of f five lines that just passes these yeah. information back. Do we have time for a follow-up question? Um, so does the vendor on the vendor side, is anything done to keep uh, rays next to each other or to keep shading work similar in that case uh, when you're doing a lot of rays? I mean, if you're doing this, you'll get less and less rays the deeper you go, which is always a problem with path tracing. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of work on vectorizing things and moving things around. Do you okay. know if the vendor has any influence on that? Say again, please. So, vendor. Um, what's the word for it? Uh, a vendor, you mean the... The vendor. The if, the, if, if, they have, if they have any influence on moving work around to keep 
the rays that you are tracing similar? Um, by default, I don't think they do anything. I I oh, yeah, okay. Sure, let's all visit his talk. Um, I something I wanted to add. Uh, That's all right. I was just curious. Let's yeah. see. And uh, I think everyone that does ray tracing knows the problem that the first intersection mm -hmm. is fast because everything is uh, coherent. That was, that was exactly. the word I was looking for. Yeah. <laughs> and but after the first bounce, um, rays randomly go through the scene, and then things become slow. In the ray queue, you don't have a ray generation shader. You have the shader that you used for issuing this. Okay. Uh, just to answer the previous question, you mentioned the shader execution reordering. And that's, that's not done by default, but that would be one thing that would reorder the rays in between the stages to keep the coherency as much as possible. Exactly, yeah. But yeah, yeah, that's pretty recent uh, extension. Yeah. It's one of the cool new advances in ray tracing. Okay. Then I think I'm done with it, and I will forward this now to uh, Bernhard. And he will talk about uh, compute shaders and synchronization within compute shaders and all that uh, fancy stuff. Okay, let's quickly hook this guy up because he's really power hungry. work? No, right? Okay, it's just for show. Okay, um, great. So, uh, thank you, Lucas. Uh, let's now look into Vulkan for compute. So, maybe quick show of hands, if you don't mind. Who here, just so that I get a feel, who here has been using Vulkan before, just so we know? Okay, okay. Who's been using uh, Vulkan in general? Uh, sorry, uh, compute in general, any graphics API? Okay, that's good to know, super interesting. Okay, um, good, that gives me a bit of a feeling for how we should speed this along. So basically I don't then, I don't need to go into much detail of why you would want to use compute because basically the reasons are known to most of you. You have this parallel power horse basically as a sidekick to your CPU now. You can use the GPU to do non-graphics related tasks, which is great. Um, so it also it unlocks certain particular features. For instance, there are some specific faster memory spaces that you don't get in the graphics API, for instance, shared memory and other features. Um, but also, this is maybe for the direction of the um, researchers and perhaps also the teachers in the room. Uh, it is quite educational because when you approach the GPU and especially with Vulkan, through compute, you basically need to kind of internalize how work distribution really works on the GPU. Like how do things work together? Why do I need a queue? How does that make sense? What is oversubscribing of the GPU with work? And all these kinds of things start to come together and you start to kind of understand the architecture that you're working with. Um, but also, and last but not least, it allows you to focus on performance, right? You don't have this complex setup, you just have this compute uh, situation where you usually have some input data, you have some targeted output data, and that's all you need to solve. The 
pipelining and the setup is all much simpler, which we will see uh, in a minute here. So we have a very uh, established background here. All of the people watching, some of you guys are researchers, some of you are students, some of you maybe also know graphics and compute from the industry. So hopefully what comes up is a solid mix of some foundations for those who don't know them, then some examples for those who are maybe looking for new applications, and then perhaps also some tools for those who would like to know how to use Vulkan efficiently or maybe a bit more efficient than uh, the standard conventional baseline that you have available. So uh, computing graphics in general is on the rise. That is not a big of, uh, bit of a secret. Last year we had a fantastic talk at HPG by Brian Karras about Nanite. Nanite, of course, is heavily involved in using compute methods, combining them to achieve multiple uh, great performance gains when the compute pipeline is more efficient than the graphics pipeline would be, basically because it gives you more freedom. We also have, of course, uh, the trend and the incredibly fast inv advancement in the field of neural rendering um, and radiance fields. And these renderers, in most any cases, they are built on top of some way of compute programming, but then again to achieve some graphics goal. Um, for instance, Incident GP, which was last year's best paper um, at SIGGRAPH, had this phenomenal the presentation of their implementation where they used these neural graphics primitives to do very fast nerve rendering. Um, also, this year, I'm happy to say that we'll be talking about our paper at SIGGRAPH, the 3D Gaussian splatting for real-time radiance field rendering, um, which is, of course, also based on compute. That's why I'm bringing it up here. Um, there's also some work that we will see later this week by colleague Markus Schütz, also again using compute to do some graphics, um, but there's also been other previous work. So this is not new, but I would say the trend is sort of increasing. Um, now this was a question just a few minutes ago. Um, what is the situation with rendering a triangle? How bad is it really? Uh, and what could we potentially do to improve this? So uh, if you follow the original Vulkan tutorial, which is like the go-to place for doing graphics, uh, and then you look at the comments you find underneath, you get a bit of a uh, yeah, you get a bit of an overview of what people are experiencing going through this. So to answer the question from just before, if you follow the official Vulkan tutorial, which is great, right? Uh, but it is verbose as it had to be in the original incantation of Vulkan. Uh, it's pretty much exactly 1,000 lines to get the triangle rendered, right? So that's not an amount of time that many of us have. Um, and it's also a very big hurdle especially if you are in the teaching direction for students to get that first motivation going. Right? The first time seeing something visual is usually the time where you get the first feeling of success. And if it takes 1,000 lines of codes to get there, that's really tough. Right? So why is Vulcan so verbose? Um, short answer is because it sort of has to be. Um, if you, for instance, compare to programming for the CPU, when you write your program for the CPU, you aren't really giving it instructions. You're maybe giving it hints, right? Then it goes through the compiler, it goes through several layers of magic, and then maybe there's some neural network even built into your CPU to help with the execution along. So you're not really writing the instructions that you get uh, for the CPU. For the GPU, things are much simpler, and you have basically pretty a a wide range of controls. So this simpler set of things that you can change and that you can set and that you can modify is pretty liberally exposed to you on the GPU. Right? So it is comparably simple, um, but one would be uh, a miss to basically, or it would basically not be true to compare, uh, liken it to a state machine, which is basically what we get with the uh, old APIs that we had for graphics, like OpenGL and DirectX. So those are by no way, you know, in no way are they bad APIs. You can get really great performance with OpenGL and DirectX 11 because people have been going through an effort to keep them sort of up to speed. But if you go into graphics or if you go into compute through these APIs, you are very likely to perceive a version of the GPU that is simply outdated based on how things are done in OpenGL, based on how OpenGL is taught. Uh, and that's kind of an issue that makes Vulkan sort of, I would say, the uh, modern or the 
uh, recommended way to approach the GPU, especially if you want to do something uh, for compute, because approaching Vulkan through compute makes it, as I find, quite a bit easier. And why is that, or what can we do to actually realize that? First of all, uh, here's a tooltip I would like to provide for those who haven't heard of it, and that is, instead of using the conventional way to go into Vulkan to use the standard API, there is a wrapper uh, called Vulkan HPP, which gives you C++ style extensions, which includes uh, constructors for structs, so you don't have to be so explicit when you want to define something, which also defines RAII style wrappers for almost anything, so you don't have to clean up after yourself when you allocated something or when you created something, and also can help you with avoiding errors by providing clean namespaces and explicit flags and class enums for the things that you can pick and assign. Um, let's see, uh, look at some code and see what we can understand from this. So uh, the previous session by Lucas, he uh, intuit intentionally removed some of the code, so uh, I'm kind of bringing it back again. Um, here we have, for instance, the basic setup to create a logical device that you can then use to do some Vulkan uh, instructions and some Vulkan action. Right. So this is, yeah, this is. Uh, not that much, but it's a significant amount of lines of code to get one very basic thing, a device, going, and you need the device always to do anything in Vulkan, right? So this is what it would look like with the classic API being somewhat minimal about it, and this is what it would look like with Vulkan HPP, right? So we can be a lot more uh, compact with Vulkan HPP because Vulkan HPP provides you with uh, the innate ability or the innate uh, ability to set the S types so you don't no longer you no longer have to specify them yourself which was sort of redundant from the very beginning um, you also have these unique RAII style objects that automatically clean up after themselves so you just create a unique device and then when it goes out of scope uh, it basically destroys itself and that's all everything that uh, needs to be done with this object taken care of um, and also it has support for SDL uh, type containers, so you don't need to build those C type structs and basically can uh, work with any kind of uh, container that you would like from the std library, convert and pass them around, and most of them will uh, have some support and be working along with Vulkan HPP. So let's go through a concrete example. What do you need with this tool at your hands to uh, build up your first compute pipeline in Vulkan? Um, I'm going to go ahead with the GLSL route. So we would need some GLSL code to execute, uh, get a compiled version of your code into SPV. Um, I'm not going to go through all the steps because let's do them like two or three at most at a time. Okay, so let's start at the beginning. Let's say we have a file with our GLSL code, so our shading language code, uh, and we want to get that compiled and then run it on uh, our spear v, uh, run it on our GPU. So uh, give me a second here. This um, is a bit, is this maybe a bit of a mistake in the slide ordering? Nope. Nope. Okay, sorry. Um, this is all fine. Yes. Yes. Okay. So before we launch, um, we need to know, or before we write our GLSL code, we basically need to know how the GPU execution model works. So this is known to most of you, so I'm going to speed through this because most of you have worked with compute already. So you know when you have a problem, like for instance this image, and you want to do something with it, uh, you basically have some sort of problem domain, for instance the pixels of it that you want to work on, and then you know that you can split it in the individual groups uh, that are then able to collaboratively do some work on them. Or not, they can ignore the fact that they are collaborative, but the important thing is you have to define these kinds of groups to work on your problem domain. And you're pretty much free to design those groups with arbitrary sizes and shapes, if you will, uh, to achieve a particular job of, for instance, computing a filter or uh, traversing and combining or converting your image in some way, for instance. Um, and the structure overall in the execution model is we have the individual problem domains uh, entries, then we have these collaborative groups, and if we look at one group in particular, we know that it is made up of multiple threads. 
And then also, this is now a hardware execution detail, is that you have these things which are in GLSL called subgroups, um, which would be called a warp in CUDA or are generally referred to as a wavefront, which is kind of a hardware detail um, where you basically say the SIMD width of the GPU is some particular factor, so it takes threads and executes them and executes instructions with this particular SIMD width. And this is something that is basically forced on you, um, which is uh, can be sort of good or bad. It, it has kind of, uh, it has some implications that you need to consider if you're writing uh, advanced code. But it also has some benefits because if you are aware of this, you can exploit it to kind of get a fast lane for data transfer between threads that are working within such a wavefront. Okay, but uh, this is known to most of you in this room, so I'm not going to dwell on it. Um, and yeah, of course, also each uh, of these APIs has their own way of referring to these things, but under the hood, they are all the same, and basically the execution model is always the same because it's always the same architecture underneath. So that is not so surprising. Okay, so now that we uh, have a quick refresher on how work is structured or layout on the GPU, um, what does this now look like when we write a GLSL file to do some work? So let's say we have our Vulkan ready GLSL, our Vulkan uh, GLSL flavor. And working with Vulkan in GLSL means we have the ability to print F, right? So we can now debug print F from our shader. This is interesting to those who have um, been looking for any way to doing uh, printf debug with Vulkan. This extension has been added. I think Vulkan was the, the first API to add this ability to their shaders. I'm, I could be mistaken, but I think uh, this was a big deal when it was first uh, became first available. So, and here we have now our example shader, which describes some sort of work group with some extent, right? So this work group is just one thread because it is one in all dimensions. So that's the extent of this work group, just one thread. Uh, and then basically it takes its IDs and writes out a message via debug printf. And then it's just a simple matter of sending this either to GLSLang or through GLSLC uh, and can end up with your SPOV. So then in order to get something running, you need to read the compiled SPOV uh, at runtime. There's a thousand ways to do this. If you have worked with any kind of file IO, you know how to load files. So again, I'm not gonna dwell too much on that. From the loaded SPOV, you then need to create a module. So basically the shader module that will make sure that your SPOV code is eventually transposed or translated uh, into actual uh, machine instructions that can then run on your GPU. Um, and let's see again how this could be done, for instance, with Vulkan. We would just need to do a create shader module unique. Um, and basically, again, you create something that you want to use in Vulkan HPP. Most often than not, it's a one-liner if it's really as simple as expressing it with a simple intent, right? I want to create an object that looks like such and such and such. It will probably be a one-liner, okay? So, uh, the module here, again, in this case, is unique. So again, this outlines one of the features of Vulkan HPP. We say here, create shader model unique. We don't have to define the exact type. So this module, when it goes out of scope, will clean up after itself. And we're basically um, saving up on half the cleanup code that you usually do when you program Vulkan with the C-style API. Okay, then we need to create the basic compute plan with that module. And this is um, for those who are um, aware or are uh, not new to Vulkan, this might come as a nice uh, change of, spa of, of pace, basically, because you know that the graphics pipeline, when you start with your uh, graphics tutorials or your graphics course, is very verbose. It has a lot of features that you can twiddle with, that you can set up, that you can figure. And basically, for any stage along the pipeline, there is something that you can specify, that you can set, uh, and that ends, also ends up in creating more source code for you to write initially and then also maintain eventually. And so if this is the graphics pipeline, then this is the, uh, this is the compute pipeline, right? So much, less thing, uh, much fewer things to maintain, much easier to set up. So actually the entire setup for a runnable compute pipeline, if we have our compiled SPRV shader, is exactly again this. So 
these are all the instructions that we need to set up a functioning compute pipeline from our compiled shader. Basically, just uh, define a shader stage, uh, create a pipeline layout, which is, again, a unique layout with no special uh, requirements in our case, um, and then just provide a stage info in which we say we want to run compute. That's all we want to do. We want to execute our module, and the entry point into the module is main. That's all that this pipeline needs to get going. Okay? Then we create a compute pipeline from that, and then afterwards it's already ready to be run and to be uh, executed by a command buffer. Okay, then that's the last part that we need to do is record set command buffer and, sorry, uh, record set command buffer, make a submission to the command buffer queue, and then synchronize with the entire uh, device or until the device is done doing it. And then our GPU job has run and is finished. Okay, so the last step is then compile, uh, set up your command buffer, find the pipeline that you want to use, submit to the queue that you have chosen, and then eventually use device wait idle. So you see here, um, in, uh, in the spirit of keeping this sort of light, I use the wooden mallet of synchronization tools, right? I use the device wait idle, which just says everything that I've submitted, make sure it's done, and then come back to me, right? That is something that you can in most cases do if you are not too keen into going into the detailed synchronization spiel that is available. Uh, the wooden mallet of wait idle is basically there to give you a basic starting point, right? And then you can work from that and make things more efficient, make them more lightweight as you see fit. Okay, so then the result of this, because we have the printf support um, with those not so many lines of code, was to create a basic application that actually prints to us. So we have basically written the equivalent of Hello World for compute in Vulkan, and it wasn't actually that big of a deal. Um, so another part that is usually quite big in terms of setting up your Vulkan application is making sure um, you have the right development environment. And the development environment usually implies you need things uh, that you are now aware of, which are validation layers. And validation layers are definitely your friends. They are uh, av available with very detailed error messages if you do something wrong, um, even if that wrong behavior is not reflected by the results the validation layers will catch it. Because more often than not, you can program an error into your GPU application, and it might be an error according to specification, but not according to your GPU, right? Your GPU, depending on the vendor, might tolerate some mistakes, might not tolerate others. Then you write your GPU code, it runs fine on your machine, you take it to your friend or your colleague, and it no longer works, right? Um, so the validation layers are there basically to save you there. So um, what can we do if we know that validation layers are valuable, but we also know that setting them up is sometimes quite an effort? Uh, this is the second tool tip that I would like to give for those who do not uh, know it yet, that is vkconfig. Um, I can very much recommend the demonstration and the description that was given at uh, this year's Vulcanized conference about the Vulcan configurator. Um, but basically what it does is with a few uh, sets uh, with a few set of clicks, it basically gives you the ability to set up your environment and to define your validation layers. You can also enable the ability to debug printf or not on demand. And basically, um, support or validation of your program becomes a tooling effort, right? It's no longer integrated into your code base so that you basically have all these different switches and lines and sets of validation layers that you can or cannot activate as you will, but it basically becomes a question of is the Vulkan configurator running in the background or not, right? And that will make the difference between are you running your program in validation mode where everything is checked and being secure or are you running it basically in uh, the mode where you not doing any checks and just running the code for maximum performance. Um, so just to illustrate the uh, VK config, uh, what it would look like, um, it's not um, super complex, so it's really easy to get an overview of all the individual features. Um, what you want to do is basically set up the types of validations that you want it to take care of for you, and you basically want to override the layers of your 
uh, Vulkan application by the configurator. And if you do these things, that means you don't really have to specify any validation layer code in your application. And that, again, makes your code base more readable, makes it easier to approach. And especially for beginners, you can just skip this step and just have the VK config running in the background, knowing that it will notify you when something was done wrong. And here, down here, we see uh, the very important feature of redirecting printf messages to the command line. So basically, when you keep that on, you can run something uh, that uses the debug printf extension, and it will appear on your command line window. So just like that. So let's take a look at what the Hello World of Vulkan Compute looks like from start to finish. So this is the entire code. So this is Vulkan Compute. Um, printing your uh, message to the command line. Uh, for good measure, it even includes the shader code, right? So everything really is in there. Um, and we are not really taking any shortcuts. We're not really taking any external libraries for doing these kinds of things. We're basically setting up the, uh, the instance, which gives us our starting point into Vulkan. We are then picking a physical device, which means which of the potentially many GPUs in your machine do you want to work with? You take a logical device, which basically is your way of saying, I cannot take the entire GPU at the time. Other processes needed it too, right? So I make a logical device. Um, and then pick from the physical device a corresponding queue, submit some work to it. And after compiling your shader into a module, make sure that you run it um, and add it to the command buffer. And once that is submitted, in the very end, you just device wait idle. Okay, so it's definitely more compact than what you would have to do for the first triangle, and it gives a, I would say, basic answer to the question, what is the first success that you would experience approaching Vulkan via the GPU route, right? So I would say, especially for those who are considering Vulkan for teaching, um, if you have the ability to approach it via compute, I would say that this is a very interesting avenue and one that also can help keep motivation a little higher than doing it in other ways. So especially for this task, uh, I basically took that to heart uh, and said, okay, let's try uh, taking a course that we did previously for uh, GPU programming. And as you would expect, this had been done up until now with CUDA applications and basically convert it to Vulkan and see how it works. So this is basically where I decided to invest the time and come up with this list of coding tasks. So basically, coding task suite that you can also, if you are interested, download it for yourself. Um, and it includes applications that give you basic text output. They are kind of, um, in, uh, in a way, sort of related to the kind of tasks you would see, for instance, in Advent of Code, if that tells you something where you sort of given a little challenge and you have to figure it out. And if you did the instructions correctly, you get maybe a secret message, or otherwise you get maybe an image that was, um, that was, that ran through an edge detector. And, but also not to uh, neglect graphics too much. We also do some rendering. We're basically doing a lightweight version of Markus Schutz point-based point cloud rendering pipeline, where we basically just render to an image and write that image out as a PNG, so we don't have to do all the Vulkan graphics setup. So we are still doing images. We're just doing it very compactly and boiling it down to the essence, right? And why would you be interested in such a setup or in such, an, uh, in such a suite of applications or exercises? I think there are several reasons why you might want to take an interest. One would be maybe you never touched Vulkan before, and uh, you think starting with compute is actually easier after seeing this. So in this case, I would agree, and that is how I would recommend it to you as well. So maybe also you know Vulkan and graphics, but you don't know its compute capabilities yet, and I guess in this case also this would make uh, a fine introduction to this. Maybe you are also looking to teach Vulkan, and especially in this case I would say if that is the case and you have some liberties, Maybe one could consider this as teaching material as well. This is what I use it for. Um, or maybe you are just genuinely curious and want to try out some new things today. Um, for all of these cases, basically we have the test suite up. So please feel free to check it out. 
um, make sure to remember that this is uh, an early alpha. Actually, I revised the code base quite majorly yesterday. Um, it certainly doesn't cover the extent of everything that can be done with compute. And if you have some sort of didactic or pedagogic um, recommendations, suggestions, um, if you find something that is just plain wrong, all of that is totally possible, please feel free to reach out to me or um, make some suggestions for improvement or maybe additional tasks that you think would make sense in there. Um, yeah, and for questions or improvements, um, please just go ahead and uh, submit them as pull requests or as issues or uh, contact us as our Discord. Okay, so uh, the approach that we took here is already fine and Vulkan HPP and the Vulkan configurator help us basically decluttering things in Vulkan, but uh, we're not exactly there yet, right? And this brings us basically to our next tool. Um, when we start writing our programs, at some point we need our input data, right? Without input data, all the GPU processing that we're doing is basically useless. So the way to define input data is by creating Vulkan resources. And again, as everything, even with Vulkan HPP, um, finding and setting up a resource that you can use in your shader has quite a number of steps. For instance, for a buffer, let's see here a uniform buffer, uh, you need to first define what it should be used for, what its memory and requirements would be, then you need to basically go through the different memories that you have available in your GPU, see if one of them fits your needs, and if one does, then you can pick that one, you can use it for allocation, then you have to bind that memory to your buffer, and finally you have something that you can fill with data and use in your shader, right? Um, so this is for one uniform buffer. Here is what needs to be done in order to create uh, not a uniform buffer, which is uh, read-only, but a storage buffer, which in Vulkan is both read and write. Uh, who can tell immediately where the difference is between the two? What changed? Okay, yeah, exactly. So basically, all of this setup here, all of these steps for different buffers are exactly the same. The only thing that changed to, uh, to change from a read-only buffer to a read-writable buffer is basically this one flag here. That's everything. So that gives us an indication of heavy code repetition that we can either solve by writing some helper functions ourselves, and then maybe discovering later on that our design wasn't that good and we have to update them and maybe write helper functions of helper functions and so on and so on. Or we can rely on the industry standard for doing exactly these kinds of things, which is the Vulkan memory allocator. So this library um, is quite battle-tested. It's used especially, I think, in the game industry quite a lot. Um, among other things, it simplifies your code. It's not the only thing it does. It also takes care under the hood of managing memories efficiently. For instance, allocating only one big batch of memory when it sees that you are doing multiple small allocations and then, then just taking them from one place. Um, it defragments your space over time. It makes sure where to pick memory from in the entire memory space. You can give it preferences. You can give it concrete advisements where or what kind of memory to pick. So it's really quite uh, convenient in these kinds of things and also quite powerful. Um, but also, of course, it makes your code quite a bit simpler, right? So this is, again, the setup compared to what we had before that you need in order to set up your buffer. And note that this, uh, unfortunately, also includes uh, code for destroying the resources again, because when we made, basically, that change to using the Vulkan memory allocator, unfortunately, we lost the support of Vulkan HPP, and th that means we also lost the RAII, so we now have to do a little bit of basic cleanup ourselves. Um, there are some people out there who are trying to maintain libraries that combine basically both of them at the same time, which would be ideal, but the support for that is for, for them is not so strong that I would say um, they are ready to be used directly for things like industry projects or teaching projects. So unfortunately, right now, a little bit more of code for the sake of uh, cleaning up our buffers because we don't have RAII for resources 
uh, I think is the middle of the road right now. Good. Um, dun 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 dun. So, yeah, uh, just a quick sneak peek into the exercises if you choose to do them in terms of resource allocation. This is pretty much as verbose as it gets. This is one application that uses three resources, that is three buffers, and uses the, um, the Vulkan memory allocator to create all of them with the different settings, and then at the end also clean all of them up. Right. So this is all of it in terms of um, memory and, and resource allocation that uh, as, as, as bad as it gets in the examples at least. Um, we also still have descriptor sets and descriptors I have yet to find uh, a way that makes them really easy and tractable to understand because for the same uh, amount of, of code that we saw before, basically for these resources, uh, this is the amount of code that you need to set up the corresponding descriptor sets, which is not bad, but I still would like it to be just a tad bit more compact, especially for the purpose of getting the information across. And usually when you try to teach descriptor sets and you say, okay, you need a pool, you need to allocate, uh, you need to define a layout that needs to um, go into the shader, uh, the pipeline creation as well. Then you use that layout to allocate a descriptor set. Then you have a descriptor set. You fill the descriptor set with descriptor, uh, with, with different descriptor rights. Um, that's usually the part where the student's eyes sort of glaze over. Like there's like just one too many steps in there. Um, and the potential way out of this is a fairly recent extension. That is the VK extension for descriptor buffers, which basically um, reveals that under the hood, descriptor sets are again just memory, right? So when you pass a descriptor to your shader and you use it to get information on where to pick your data from, it's again just using a particular memory. It might be in a special location, but it's still just memory. So with this extension, you can treat it as such, and you can basically define a buffer that acts as your descriptor set, and then basically defining the contents of a descriptor set becomes a simple mem copy, right? So that might be a very good uh, alternative, and I'm monitoring how the development on that is um, a bit, but uh, for now, it still needs cutting-edge drivers. So when I tried it yesterday, uh, because my driver was, I think, uh, four months or three months old, this extension wouldn't run. After updating, it's fine, but still, that's a little bit cutting it too close for me to go ahead and recommend it uh, to be used in general. Okay, good. So, okay, so. Um, <coughs> A totally different thing or a mechanic that, since most of you have been working with compute, uh, but um, yeah, I kind of tried to include it as well because it's fairly interesting uh, concept for those who don't know that much about compute uh, is the heavy ability to use the atomic operations and also what it implies in the context of compute shaders. So just a quick recap for those who are not familiar um, with the concept or not that familiar with the concept of parallel memory accesses. With the atomic operations, you basically get the method of accessing memory in a way that is indivisible. So that means because there are thousands of threads running on your GPU, you don't really get to schedule them in a very fine grained manner, but you at least get to enforce that the accesses seem to occur in some sort of undefined order, right? And in many cases, that is all that we need. Just these relaxed atomics, which at the end of running your program, make the program end up in a state where it looks like this could have been achieved by doing some ordered sequence of operations, even though that um, a, a kind of order is ephemeral and not clearly defined, but at least it seems that way, right? That is all the guarantee that you get with these relaxed atomics. So why are they useful and how are they useful for compute and the overlap of graphics? So again, this brings us back to the uh, computations and the contributions that, for instance, uh, Markus Schütz in the point cloud community rendering uh, community has done where we discovered that 
uh, basically, if you take many instances of primitives and you have some way of splitting them to the screen, then a very fast way to discover which of them actually ends up being the closest to a pixel is, for instance, to use the atomics. Right? In this case, you could say after or during even the projection and the splatting of different primitives to the frame buffer, you can make a selection of which one is the one ending up the winner by simply and atomically always comparing their z values. And then, in the end, with the atomic operations, you avoid data races and you definitely end up with the one entry that would have been the closest and you can then use that to do correct visibility resolution. Um, here's an example of that that is also included in the exercises where we basically see a very basic uh, variant of what Markus did. Um, it's significantly reduced but the uh, impression is, uh, is there. So. What is important to keep in mind is I gave this at some point to the students and I asked them to try it with the standard minimum method and once with the atomic min method. And they basically said, well, both of them are fine, right? Um, so here's, I, I ran this actually twice, and here's both of them, once with atomic on the left, once without atomics on the right. Um, first, second, first, second, and it takes really uh, a keen eye to see the differences here, but luckily we have the ability to scale up and then things become a lot more clearly, right? So that's especially when you try to convey the importance of correct ordering on the GPU. Again, it is often so that if you're doing it incorrectly, the differences can be very subtle, but they are definitely there, especially if you maybe apply your knowledge from the previous graphic session and do a runtime real-time renderer where you keep rendering this image over and over and over and then suddenly you will see the differences like crazy, right? So that might be a nice task uh, that you might want to do if you're going through these exercises later. Okay, so another example where we can use atomics is, for instance, for the uh, propagation of gradients. So this is from our uh, recent or basically to uh, appear or to uh, be presented Seagraph paper um, where we had the uh, idea or where we had the approach of taking multiple Gaussian splats. So again, this is sort of coming from the same direction as was Markus Schütz had been doing with his point-based rendering, um, where we take in Gaussian splats and blend them basically together, alpha composite them uh, back to front. And in order to do this, we basically need to do uh, okay, let's, uh, in order to end up with the scene that we see here, of course, this is not given to us from the start. That would not be a very good paper. Um, but we are given some sort of rough, uh, rough approximation of primitives uh, and start from those and then optimize the primitives into the position so that it hopefully almost looks photoreal, right? And the way that you do this is by using a differentiable renderer. So that means in a differentiable renderer, at some point you need to compute from the loss the gradients to update all your individual uh, attributes of your primitives, which we did here as well. Our primitives are Gaussians. So when we render, and when we render differentiably, and when we want to propagate back the error, we have the individual Gaussians that contributed to each individual pixel. And because we are doing actual alpha blending, the order is important. And that has a few, uh, for us, I would say, complex implications, which I'm not going to go into um, very, uh, in, in very much detail. But the important part to take care of here, or to, to remember here, is we have only the budget to run through these Gaussians um, for a particular pixel once, like not a very high number of times. We can run through them maybe once if we want to stay efficient. Right? So we need to basically settle on a way, how do we want to propagate those gradients? How do we want to take the error and propagate it back to the individual primitives if we can only visit each Gaussian once per pixel that it overlaps? And the way that we do it is by basically computing for each individual pixel a portion of the total gradient 
namely the corresponding portion of the gradient that this each individual pixel is responsible for, and then they all need to get added up. How can we add them up? Of course, if we, can, uh, if we have the availability of atomics, we can use atomic adds, and this is in this case, for instance, exactly what we do, right? From each individual pixel, each of them contributing a small gradient or part of the complete gradient back to the attributes of the Gaussian, they all get atomically added back up, and that is how they get propagated back. Okay, I'm um, trying to maybe accelerate a little bit here. Um, so, do we need more examples on atomics? Um, yeah, maybe. So, I think, given that you all have some sort of compute background, uh, maybe someone can immediately blurt out what is wrong with this shader. We want to do an atomic reduction. Why doesn't this work? Oh, sorry. No, wrong, wrong answer. <laughs> Actually, this does work. Sorry, it's just bad. Okay, so uh, this is not a good application uh, of the GPU because, yes, it works, but the way we are doing it here, that's not uh, a great way of uh, exploiting your GPU for doing a basic job like taking all the entries of an array and adding them together. Okay, what would be a uh, direct, uh, what would be a very straightforward improvement to this kind of approach? What can one suggest? Right, okay, sure. That was even one step further than uh, I was going for. I was just going for uh, using the an, uh, additional shared memory that we have available in your compute. So basically, starting first with an atomic shared into, compute, uh, into shared memory and then using that uh, in order to ato update a, a global atomic, right? So that's skipping one step. Now the question is, uh, this is now faster, right? So we exploited shared memory on the GPU. But now it's wrong. Do you also, can you also give the straight explanation of why the result is wrong? Yes. At which point? If statement. So before the if statement. Okay, is that the only place? Oh yeah, no, sorry. And also, yeah, between. Uh, on both sides of the atomic add mm. and shared memory. So yep. first it needs to be set to zero, then the thread can start adding to it. Then you need another synchronization so the first thread can read the result and then write it out to global memory. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this new version is wrong. Uh, it doesn't work. It's being smarter. It's faster, but it's also wrong. And that is because exactly we have been implementing arrays here, right? There's a read after write hazard here, and there's a read after write hazard here in both places, basically. So this is the difference. Um, again, I'm sort of preaching to the choir here with all your compute knowledge, but this is something that maybe for those who don't know that much about compute is often worth revisiting. Um, if you have your experience of thread safe, multi-threaded programming from the CPU, you have been working with a very forgiving architecture comparably, right? You usually have maybe a dozens of threads on the CPU um, and the X, 86 model is usually quite forgiving um, when you write data races or don't synchronize your accesses properly, and the GPU, that is really not the case, right? So, but this might, but this might be fun. This is, uh, could be interesting so that I can get a bit of more of an overview. So maybe, again, a short show of hands. Who knows the concept and how to apply memory fences? Okay, awesome. Um, who can is comfortable explaining the difference between release and acquire atomics. Okay, cool. Right, yeah, okay, okay. Anybody out there who can explain and uh, reason about out of thin air values? Okay, good, interesting, yeah. Um, so these, these are all super fun, right? And when you write for multi threaded programs, all of these things pop up and all of those become potential danger, right? And as I said, the x86 architecture will usually kind of look away and accept if you uh, don't use these things correctly, but the GPU does not, right? So the good thing about Vulkan, and this is one of its standalone points, is that in contrast to previous 
GPU APIs, it actually goes through the effort of defining a clear memory consistency model for you. Right? So the Vulkan specification includes a clear C++11 style memory consistency model, which uh, can, for instance, also do release acquire atomics, which is actually great for those who do not want to use more synchronization effort than they need to. Um, and also, it clearly and specifically um, forbids values out of thin air, right? So if you don't know about them, you can safely continue to ignore them, right? Because in Vulkan, they don't happen. So that's good news for you, okay? Good. Uh, so if you are maybe fuzzy on these concepts, I think that for anybody who's doing multi-threaded programming, um, looking these things up is quite important because at some point they may creep up again. So if you're fuzzy on release, uh, acquire semantics and atomics, um, I could highly recommend some very, very helpful re resources that I found to be super informative on these kinds of things and really g gave me an appreciation of why architectures need a particular memory consistency model. That would be uh, Anthony Williams' Uh, f fantastic book, C++ Concurrency in Action, and then also Herb Sutter's talk on atomic weapons. Okay? So, um, the solution was already given by our colleague over yonder, which was that we have to apply a barrier. Uh, in terms of a Vulkan lingo, a barrier is both an availability and a visibility operation, which means that not only does it make information or data available to others, but it also informs a certain group of others that this information is actually available and that their information might be outdated. Okay? So that in Vulcan terms is an availability operation followed by a visibility operation with the scope, in the case of a barrier, of the entire work group. Right? So that means the fix to the problem that we saw before as uh, was stated to us already correctly, was to protect this atomic access in the middle here with a barrier. And now actually we get our, uh, this actually includes the wrong times, I'm sorry, it should say 16 milliseconds. Uh, and now the values are actually also correct. Okay, um, du -du 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 -dum. I'm gonna skip the example of staging because it's actually part of the exercises if you're interested in knowing more about it. Um, I want to quickly mention that we talked quite a bit about synchronization today. We said there are many ways to do it and I just did as well. Um, and I think there's an important difference between synchronization for correctness and synchronization for performance. So in the previous case, we saw a, a synchronization for correctness, right? Without it, we wouldn't have gotten the correct result. I think that's really, really important, no matter where you're coming from when you're trying to uh, program your GPU. When it comes to performance, I'm willing to bet that in many, many applications that you do, um, especially if you are maybe coming in from the machine learning community, you might not need those fine grade synchronization mechanisms until you're ready to use them, right? So synchronization, if you are able to uh, invest some sort of time, is always and in, in many ways uh, possible by simplifying your program and using those wooden mallets that we talked about, like for instance, device weight idle, right? So synchronization doesn't have to be complex. Minimum overhead synchronization is um, more involved and requires you to have some understanding of the basics. But the good news is that in many applications, especially if you are in the machine learning community, and I'm, not no, I'm hoping not to generalize here, or, uh, but then usually you don't care about those kinds of benefits that you get from really minimum overhead synchronization. Most likely your time is spent somewhere else. Okay? So I, what I'm saying is basically pick your battles. So if, you're doing, if you really have the, uh, the job of writing a job that is, or writing an application that is efficient, make sure that you don't do the mistake that many people do when they first go into uh, compute programming and trying to use it to do something efficiently, and that is over-optimizing maybe the kernel that you just wrote, or the dispatch job, or the compute job that you just wrote. Um, 
always go ahead and find out what is actually the part of your program that is slowing you down, and then go ahead and treat that. Right? That will save you a ton of time. So I think um, yeah, there's also, yeah, especially for Vulkan, quick shout out to RenderDoc, which is a very useful tool for debugging. Again, if you go through the exercises, um, it, there is included a setup for you to use it to do some basic debugging of your code. Uh, the video is unfortunately not playing in this slideshow. That's a shame, but oh, maybe uh, maybe now it is. Okay, so yes, no, maybe. Nope, it's not coming. Okay, maybe I can <laughs> I can deliver it at some later point in time. All right, so. Now it is. Okay, sure. Um, basically, it gives you the ability to launch your job, capture what is happening on the GPU, and then basically go through a replay of what happened in an emulated uh, shader, uh, basically in a, in a shader emulator, right? And recently, that emulator also includes compute. So if we ran some compute pipeline, we can actually pick a thread in our setup, and then we can step through it and see what kind of changes it went through. Um, which is super nice, super helpful, very portable, but keep in mind this is an emulation, right? So it's nice to get you started, and it's as far as we are in terms of portable debugging in Vulkan, but it's not the entire shebang. It's not a real full-fledged debugger, but it's a very good start. Um, there are some challenges for Vulkan in compute still. Um, I'm going to skip over them because I think I'm already over time. Um, if you feel like it, I'm sure you will find these issues at some point for yourself. Something that I would like to uh, highlight, because I would be very happy to see it, would be if we could get maybe similar support in terms of functionalities and libraries that we are seeing with other APIs, right? We know that the performance of Vulkan, even and especially given its portability, can be as high and sometimes higher than really optimized CUDA libraries, um, which was, for instance, shown at Vulcanized by the author of VKFFT. Unfortunately, I don't remember his name, um, but you can, be, you can easily look it up. So we know that there is a large potential, especially given the portability of Vulkan, to have libraries that are fast and could potentially run anywhere. And it's mostly a question of, uh, the community and people who would be invested or interested of taking things like um, BLAS libraries, sorting libraries, and making an approachable and battle-tested version that really runs in Vulkan, which would give a great boost to using these kinds of features on all kinds of platforms. Okay? So um, this brings me to the end. Um, I'm sorry that I pretty much filled out the time. If you have any <laughs> questions, please approach me afterwards. Um, in general, we need to say thanks to all those who were involved in the process of developing the material for this tutorial here today, from our fellows at TU Wien up to those who started the initial journey of uh, CUDA and GPU teaching at TU Graz. And of course, High Performance Graphics as a venue who has been super nice in organizing and welcoming us. And they really did quite a job on setting all this up with high quality presentation methods, uh, techniques, mics, like um, I tip my hat to you. Um, and then, of course, the Kronos Group and its community, including particularly Tim Lewis, who is always there to communicate and make sure people exchange information and setting up relations between those who might be willing to promote uh, more info and interest about Vulcan. And yeah, that's pretty much it. If you have any questions and there are quick please go ahead if you think they might interest others. Otherwise, feel free to approach me afterwards. Thanks. Well. <laughs> Thank you very much, Bernard. Thank you very much, Lucas, for this amazing talk. Amazing show. I think uh, since we are on time for the break now, maybe uh, if you want to make questions, you can stay here for a while. With I'm pretty sure they will appreciate your answer, sure. but uh, we are a little. I mean, we are on time for the break now, and so that's it works. Okay, thank you very much again. Thank you.